Good morning. It's very nice to see a full house. No, just kidding. Uh, my name is Larry Bodges. I'm a director of faculty development, and I'm also assistant professor of educational leadership. So I wear two hats. Um, it's very nice to have you here this morning. Um, we are going to, in a few minutes, we're going to have an incredible panel for you. Um, but before we do that, um, I want to just say a couple of things. One, um, the theme of our uh, convocation this year is deepening our connections. And I'm hoping that that's actually what's happening among us all as we turn to each other as resources, as support people, as new contacts. Um, kind of a lot of that stuff can't happen unless we're together face to face. And I know, you know, people are in different campuses and people are in different parts of the campus here in University Park, and we also have students and other instructors who are far flung who have come here um, for this purpose of deepening our connection. So we're very, very happy that you're here. We're going to continue the faculty convocation year after year after year because it's important for us to be together face to face and deepen our connections. Um, to that end, I'm now going to introduce Drew Tatusco, who is the Assistant Director of Faculty Development, who's going to talk to you about our website and other very interesting things. Drew. So now I have to be very interesting. <laughs> Good luck with that. No. <laughs> Um, what I wanted to show you is, is the uh, faculty development website. We recently had a redesign of it. If you ever saw the one beforehand, please forget. Um, we weren't too enthralled about that one, so we went on a project to uh, redesign it and make it more user-friendly um, so that you could actually find information that was useful there. And we're excited about it because we're able to archive things like this um, there. So. Part of what we're trying to do with this is, is to find different ways to create community after events like this and after people participate in some of our programs such as the OL course series, um, the OL 4000 course authoring uh, session that we do um, once a year, and other activities as we try to build out our program to meet different needs. So this is an experiment, and as I was telling Kyle Peck beforehand, um, I don't teach science, but I've taught the history of science in various capacities. Um, my background is in um, the history of higher education is what I did my dissertation work in. So I know that a lot of science has to do with failing. You know, Edison, how many light bulbs did Edison and his staff come up with before that he finally figured that one out? Anybody? Thousands, right? Well, I mean, he didn't actually, his staff <laughs> were really the ones who said, hey, Tom, is this one good? And it failed, and he said, no, try it again. Um, that's a New Jersey thing, I guess. So, um, <laughs> so this might not work, what I want to do now, but um, I want to find ways to make it work and to see how we can have a sustainable community outside of the uh, boundaries of time and space that we have at events and courses. So, on our website, it's wcfd.psu.edu, and you can remember that. Um, we considered making uh, hats like the uh, New York Fire Department, you know, WCFD, um, but that would be just really cheesy. Um, so imagine that in your head and how cool it would be and, and realize that we're not doing it. Um, unless you really want a t-shirt, go on to, uh, you know, one of those t-shirt sites and you can make it yourself. Um, it's only 15 bucks. So, under community, this is where we want to start playing with the idea of creating the sustainable community online. Um, so, as an experiment, um, under community, click on 2013 convocation. So, what we're trying to do, there was a, a session yesterday on how to use Yammer. And what we're trying to do is use Yammer as the vehicle to create this community so that you can access it through an embedded uh, script on our page and then also to link out to the actual Yammer site. This is a Penn State community um, site. So it works a lot like Facebook, it's similar to that, but there are a lot more opportunities for project management 
and so forth. So I was just reminding myself what my password was before this. So, <laughs> yeah, nice one. I almost fell for it too. Um, so uh, I'm going to click Login with Yammer. And it's, it pops up, um, log in with your Yammer account. This will be your Penn State uh, web access, username, and password. So I'm going to put this down at the expense of, or at the risk of feedback, and type that in. All right. You can hear my typing, so it's authentic. do not want to keep myself logged in on this computer. All right, so now it's connecting with Yammer. And it's asking me for that again. Okay. All right, so then you just scroll down, and boom, there's the, there's the Yammer piece that's, uh, that's in here. Um, is everybody, did everybody who did try to log in, um, did that work? Or did nobody else try but me? <laughs> it's very possible. Oh, so we have some, okay, good. Um, so what we want, um, want you to try to do is uh, to put a new post in this Yammer group um, addressing the question of what else would you like to learn or know about based on your experience at the convocation? Um, this is an important question for us because we want to find out how we can best meet the needs of faculty to um, uh, develop teaching skills for our students in the online environment. Um, so give it a shot. Um, Here's the beauty of this. Once you log in into um, this instance where you can see the most recent ticker expand of different posts and comments, um, if you click on if you click on 2013 World Campus Faculty Convocation, this actually brings you out to the actual Yammer site where you can see more of that information displayed. So this is something that we also want to try with the OL courses. One of the needs that we've had expressed with the OL courses is, OK, so I just finished OL 2000, now what? So there hasn't been a place to go out to in order to either continue the connection made with uh, colleagues in those courses or to address different needs. One of the uh, things that we've talked about um, and we'll continue talking about perhaps with the, uh, the panel on our um, um, MOOC instructors is the idea of, of, and Anna actually talked about this yesterday, of students teaching students um, and how that works. Now, as instructors, being more independent learners, that might be an area where we can help each other out. So that if we have questions, find resources and things like that to help us develop our teaching as online instructors, we want to see if this can be a place where that type of interaction can happen. Um, again, this is an experiment. If this doesn't work, if this isn't the best way to do that, we want to know how we can do that more effectively. What are the different tools that we can use to help continue that conversation outside of events like this? Um, we want to hear from you. Um, we've heard it as a need expressed, but this is one of those things where it's hard to do without consistent participation from people. Um, there has to be a critical mass of, uh, of people posting on a consistent basis. This is not only something that you might find in research uh, on online communities, but if you go to any community where um, there are, uh, for instance, you might find, uh, I, I will often go out to a community to find an answer for that one formula that I forget how to do in Excel. There are communities online with these star posters who just have the answer. And I don't need to pay anybody to get the answer. If you go to Microsoft Help, I think you still have to pay for it. Is that true? 
That was my experience, so I ditched it a long time ago. So there are people out there, experts, who are just willing to share their stuff with people. Um, it's a very open source kind of community with these sorts of, of help issues that people might find. So we want to see how we can continue the conversation and continue making connections um, after this event. Um, so Wayne just said hi, Drew. Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> There's Wayne right there. Um, so, uh, so this is the way that this can work, and, um, and we'll see. So during the day, pop into this community, see what kinds of questions people are asking, see what kinds of ideas are being expressed. During the uh, panel this morning and um, the student panel this afternoon, which um, everybody needs to attend because hearing from our students is the best way to understand how we're actually doing in the online classroom or the classroom. Um, student feedback is absolutely essential to the way that I prepare for teaching my next course. Um, so let's continue the conversation. You can also see on the, um, on the bottom right, you can see who's online now within the, in, in your own network. So as you meet people, you can have synchronous conversations as well. So that's pretty much it. Any questions about Yammer and, and this medium? Does everybody have enough coffee? I could use a third cup. <laughs> Three before lunch, one after. Okay. Um, if you have any questions or anything, find me. Um, if you have any uh, suggestions, um, ask Larry. <laughs> um, but right now I want to introduce uh, Kyle Peck, who by now um, you should know well because he's been up here. This is his third time up here. Um, <laughs> so uh, Kyle's going to lead the uh, discussion with our um, MOOC faculty, who can come up here as well. You don't have to jump up on the stage. There are steps over there or over there. Did you release the mic? Yeah. Great. You want one? Yeah, I want to hand those out and I'll put this down. And I will really look for a place to put this. Uh, I get this one. You get those three. All right, thanks for coming, for joining us today. We have uh, three of several, three of many uh, of our professors who were our MOOC pioneers, people who were teaching our first massive open online courses to tens of thousands of people. And we appreciate the invitation, Larry, and uh, the program committee to talk with you this morning. I'm going to start by asking each of them to, just to introduce themselves. Uh, primarily because I know them all so well, it didn't occur to me to Google them. And it, as, as I stepped toward the uh, front of the room this morning, I realized I don't know their exact titles. I don't know, uh, I know a lot about them, but I don't know enough to really do an introduction justice. So while they're doing that, uh, go ahead and I'll be uh, preparing for my next comment here. We're going to invite you to send questions. Go ahead and please introduce yourself, Anthony. Hi, uh, I'm Anthony Robinson. I'm a vice provost for online education at Penn State. Yeah. So yeah, I was gonna yeah. Say I that. most of you are on your devices, some, some of you multiple, so I'm just trying to <laughs> wake people up a little bit. I'm, a, I'm lead faculty for online geospatial education programs in uh, the Department of Geography, the John A. Dutton E. Education Institute, the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences, and I taught a uh, map, map book. Very good, thanks, Anthony. Uh, let's see, what, what can I make up about myself? Hmm, uh, not really. So I'm an associate professor of mechanical engineering and engineering design. I'm in the College of Engineering, but I'm located at Penn State Great Valley. And uh, I was one of three instructors for the Creativity, Innovation, and Change MOOC. And I want to point out that one of my co-instructors, Jack Matson, is also here this morning. And Daryl Veligal was the other instructor. And um, let's see. I can't think of anything. One really thing you creative. forgot is your name. My name. Yeah, yeah, I don't know my name. My name is Catherine Yablico. Sorry about that. And um, I've known Kyle for a good long time and could tell some interesting stories, but I won't. But don't, yes. No. Uh, my name is Anna Davinsky. I'm lead faculty of the Digital Arts Certificate Program, and I teach art online for the College of Arts and Architecture. I also teach um, studio courses for University of Pittsburgh, and I'm an artist. Thank you. So as moderator, I did do the other important part of my job, which was formulate a few questions that I'm going to uh, use to 
extract the wisdom of some of the wisdom that these professors have. But we're also going to invite you to send questions. So you'll see on the big screens here that there are two ways you can send questions. You can send questions through text, or if you have a, a device that's online, you can actually go to the website pollev, P O L L E V dot com slash P S U W C. I should have done the WCFD thing, but I didn't. Just <laughs> WC, World Campus, Penn State World Campus. If you go there, there'll be a little text box. You can type your question in and hit submit. If you go the text route, just use your cell phone. And the address is the 37607. So you use that as if it were a phone number to which you are texting. Then as the first word of your text, you'll put in the 514406, which will remain at the top of the screen a space, and then your question. So those are two ways. A third way that I'm thinking of including at the end is just voice, but if you want to use this. What I was thinking is people can see that, and we can sort of roll those in, and you can not have to hold questions till the end. So feel free. So I have a, a text ready to go, so I'm going to demonstrate. When I sent my text, it's going to pop up on the screen, and everybody except the people who need to see it will be able to see it. Cool. However, I, have a, I also have my laptop here where I can read the questions to them. The idea was that they might be able to look through your questions and say, ooh, I like this question. I'd like to comment on that one. But since they can't see it, maybe we'll just, I'll just hand them out. So two ways you can get your questions in. With that said, I'll get the, the uh, ball rolling by going to my questions, uh, which begin with uh, congratulations on completing your first MOOC. Uh, how did it go? And what, was it what you thought it would be? And what surprised you? Uh, what would you do differently next time? And feel free to ignore any or all of those questions. So pick from among those. Anna, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I was really surprised by um, everything, pretty much. I was surprised that um, the MOOC that I taught was an introduction to arts. So it was specifically designed for students without any previous art experience. And I was extremely surprised that there were a lot of professionals within the MOOC. Uh, professional artists, photographers, um, digital artists, uh, teachers, and I think there were many reasons for them to want to be in the MOOC. Um, some of them wanted to try a new medium. Uh, some of them really liked the idea of having a set schedule where they had to generate work for every week. And some of them, I think, were interested in teaching and wanted to see an approach. Um, I was surprised by how committed and serious the students were. They came in and, you know, we made the rubrics and the directions very light because that's what I was told that, you know, most students are not going to spend a lot of time on their assignments and it was completely the opposite. They were so committed and serious and they were uh, learning within the course but then they were going and doing additional research and spending hours and days on their artwork and they were just taking it very seriously. Um, I was also surprised how quickly people self-formed groups. They organized into groups to find community within such a big um, core, such a big community of people. And those groups were based on age and experience in art and background, language. Um, so, and also the professionals, the artists who were experienced were encouraging the people with less experience. So they were working together and helping each other out. Um, Great. Sounds like one thing I'm hearing is when you have tens of thousands of people in a course, mm -hmm. you have hundreds of different reasons for them to be there yeah. and many, many different <coughs> levels of interest and experience. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else before we move it on? Um, I'll, okay. I'll add it later. Catherine, <laughs> we want to pick up from there? Sure. Um, I think I was surprised in, in addition to the seriousness and the amount of of effort that the students were willing to put in. Mm -hmm. um, that was surprising for, for me as well because like you, I had this image that um, you know there would be students who, who were kind of dropping in and dropping out and, and they wouldn't have um, the same sort of motivation as a student getting a course for credit. And that was exactly the opposite. The students were, they were passionate about what we were teaching. They were passionate about being there. And I think the depth of that passion surprised me sometimes, that there were people saying, uh, saying things that you, you've, you've changed my life. You have, um, you've saved my life. You have um, changed the way that I look at myself. And you know, when you have a class of 30 people, 
maybe after 10 sections you get somebody that says that to you. But when you go into the forums and you read that every day, and it, it, it changes your view of yourself as the impact that you're having. Um, so that was something that surprised me. It also surprised me, I knew we were going to reach around the world. Mm -hmm. That's what we were told, but I didn't realize the extent still to that. It's still sort of mind-boggling mm -hmm. to see 165 countries show up in our MOOC and to see 130,000 people sign up and to see them talking to you personally. So if you think it's this impersonal experience, it's very personal. Mm -hmm. And they're making personal comments about how you've reached them and how you communicate them with them. So the extent of that personal contact surprised me at times. You guys took all the good ones. Um, <laughs> That's why and that, that. Yeah, so this is harder. Uh, I guess just uh, jumping on Catherine's point about um, personal contact, I had the exact same feeling about the class. I really wasn't expecting to really talk to anybody in depth or, or make a connection like that. But like you said, within a few hours of the class opening, there were people providing these amazing reactions. I mean, some of them were amazingly negative. <laughs> uh, uh, so, that, I mean, you know, we're, we like to, we're thinking now about, oh, it was over and we're remembering all the good stuff. Uh, it is pretty nerve wracking because you get, you know, complete opposite reactions to some things that you do in the course. Um, some people are very indignant about the free thing you made them. Um, so, and so that's, that, that can be a little bit challenging as an instructor because you're like, well, I, I made that for you. Like, he, you actually don't get to decide. Um, it's my, my decision. But, but there are many, many positive things that happen and the global reach and personal interaction kind of came together to me. Um, uh, two weeks ago, I was actually in Singapore for a meeting and um, I met quite a few students there. Just randomly, you happen to be at this meeting about mappings, it's not that random. Um, but one of them was just like kind of freaking out about it. <laughs> and it really made me feel uh, special, but also a little, I mean, very awkward. <laughs> I'm a normal person like the rest of you. So I just felt like I can't even believe this person cares. I mean, but, and, but for her, she had been watching these lectures and talking, I guess, uh, with me in the, in the forums, things like that. And so for her, it was absolutely a real thing. Um, so it, it is easy to kind of cast them off as like, well, there's no possibility that people will be motivated to do these things, um, find them valuable, or find personal connections in them to a faculty instructor like we would have in our sort of, quote, normal, smaller online classes. But I definitely think that that is possible, given our three of us had almost identical experiences like that. Well, thank you. That reminds me, I mean, one <laughs> of the articles I read that really made me mad said, these MOOC professors, they're just doing it because they have huge egos and they want to be loved by the world. They want to become, and, and I know so many of the people involved that I said, that, that really makes me mad. So I'm going to ask you, why did you do it? Why did you decide that a MOOC was the right thing, the thing you needed to do at this point? Why? Um, I think it was just a, a unique opportunity. And um, I really like the idea of people talking about art and making art and reaching out to so many people. And, having such diverse students. So it just seemed uh, like an, incred an incredible opportunity. I didn't even question it. Right, and you, don't, you had doing. done the World Campus, so you taught R10 through World Campus and then did the iTunes University. So you'd already yes. tried to give away yes, your content and so had given like away your content really, in another format. Yeah. Okay, Absolutely. Catherine, why'd you guys do it? it well, it, in the opportunity, the unique opportunity and the, and the challenge of it, mm -hmm. I felt like this is the bleeding edge of, of online technology. And as an engineer, I like to do things on the bleeding edge of technology. So, you know, let me try this. I've, I've taught world campus courses for five or six years, and that was sort of bleeding edge for me five or six years ago. Here, let's take this one step further. And, and I also had sort of a, a, a personal reason. I feel Penn State has been in the negative news for a number of years, and I felt like this is a chance to reach out to the world and say, you know, people at Penn State are really great people. We're a cool place. We're a good place, and we do good things. And speaking of great people, so Jack Matson, when he first came to me with the idea he wanted to do a creativity MOOC, he said something like, imagine if we can improve the creativity of hundreds of thousands of people around the world. I mean, what better can you do with your time than improving the creativity? So most people come from, and I, I guess I'm stealing your thunder here, that, but they come from a place of passion about what their, their content, and they want to share that with the world. And they know not everybody can afford a Penn State education. Anthony, did I just say what you were going to say? Thanks a lot, Kyle. Sorry, all right. 
We're a great team. I, I did it because I have a huge ego. Oh. <laughs> That's what people want you to say, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a fixed term faculty member. I, I love being called a super professor because that's awesome. Uh, I would like to just be called a professor first. That would be pretty neat. That'd be pretty, me pretty neat. Um, anyway, uh, so I actually really wanted uh, to achieve a very simple goal and I saw that it was possible through a MOOC and that was to teach people how to make their first maps. Um, so much like the, I mean, all three of us kind of had very basic level interest in, in our subject and wanting to get that out to way more people and these right now are a way to do that to tens of thousands of people. Um, on the other side of the coin, as a person that leads uh, online programs that are taught to traditional small size classes, very small graduate level courses, um, I want to see what these things can do and understand them really well so that um, I'm much more competitive at keeping us ahead of the curve and making sure that someone doesn't eat my lunch. Um, so it has very practical uh, level appeal to me too, but really the first thing was the chance to teach the biggest ever class in my discipline and help people understand what I think is so cool about mapping. Thanks. I, I see that uh, one of the questions that came in was something we probably should have addressed in the introductions, my bad, since I didn't do a formal introduction, <laughs> is what classes did you teach? So <laughs> could, you, could you sort of go ahead and talk about yeah, we'll the these courses order. and whether they're equivalent to an existing Penn State course or not? That's a great question. Uh, so my class was not a class that I currently teach or that we currently teach here um, for resident or a normal online instruction. Um, I built a completely new course that's designed to fit inside a MOOC. So for complete novice audience around the world, I, I designed toward that target. The class was designed to make your first map, um, tell a story with mapping, understand a little bit about map design, know enough to be dangerous, and hopefully become motivated to become a geographer or at least pursue, pursue some further learning in geography. So geography awareness kind of class. And uh, the, our course was called Creativity, Innovation, and Change, which is a course that Jack Matson has been teaching as a regular course here at Penn State. And elements of which I teach at Great Valley in the Systems Engineering Program and the Engineering Management Program. Daryl Veligal also uses some of the concepts he brought to the course in his chemical engineering courses. So we were taking three you know, instruction from three professors who have taught this material online and in the, in the classroom and integrating that into a single course. But there were definitely elements of it that none of us had done in a regular classroom, um, different formats, different projects, that kind of thing. But there was a basis in our, in our uh, regular teaching. Uh, my MOOC was called Introduction to Art, uh, Concepts and Techniques, and that's based on the course that I teach online here through World Campus. Um, it was, the content was exactly the same, but the delivery was very different um, to meet the MOOC requirements, a lot of copyright issues that come with images. Um, the workload was less than obviously than the Penn State course. Uh, the course focused on students making art and also writing artist statements. So they learned about different art movements and artists and techniques. Also there were a lot of videos of me talking to the students and showing them different mediums and techniques and then they had to address each assignment by creating an artwork, writing an artist statement, then uploading it and then they would get matched up with partners automatically and critique each other's work. So in essence, they were teaching one another by providing one another with feedback. Thank you. So one of the questions that comes up a lot, uh, which was just entered four minutes ago, is how has teaching a MOOC changed your approach to teaching? So what, what's different now as you approach thinking about teaching and actually teaching? I can start this one. We'll start in the middle yeah. this time. Right. One of the things that I learned um, in the MOOC is the, the power of, of focused, simple messaging of what you say. So I think we, we have this luxury normally in a classroom of, you, know, you, you can talk for half an hour, you can talk for 50 minutes. I teach three hour classes, you know. When you know you have that time, you, you, tend, you know what you want to say that night, but you don't focus it down into chunks and pieces because you have the luxury of time. When you have to condense your important message into five minutes because that's about the length that your video needs to be, it makes you think about what you're teaching in a whole different way. So that was one thing, and that, that's tremendously powerful. I'm using it in my face-to-face -face teaching now. So I go in every night for my first lecture, and the first thing I say is a five-minute this is what we're doing tonight. And now the rest of the class then is developing that. 
Um, we also had for our MOOC uh, an acting coach professor in the, in the theater department, Dr. Susan Russell, who taught us that students see you before they hear you. And so what they see and how you present yourself physically is a very powerful thing. And so I walk into my classroom thinking about that image and what I look like mm -hmm. differently than I did before. And so those are some things that, that will impact my teaching from now on. Thank you, Catherine. Anthony, we'll come to you next. In addition to thinking uh, a lot more tactically about making very, very tight learning objectives and uh, stuff that people around the world can sort of interpret um, very, very easily, um, it's also caught, taught me to be more open to other forms of engagement that are kind of parallel to the class. So when you teach a MOOC, right, whether you like it or not, there are things that happen on Twitter and Facebook and uh, in other countries, social media forums like QQ in China and vContact in, um, in Russia. And so I really enjoyed seeing the development of those things. And I'm a lot, a lot less shy now to introduce those things to my classes. And I used to, I used to feel like I'd be a creepy guy professor um, if I was saying like, hey, why don't we get on Facebook and talk to each other? Um, and now I'm a lot more willing to be like, okay, well, we're just gonna, I'm just gonna have this open at least. And if you wanna use it or something, that's fine. And I'll occasionally seed the, the page with those things because that was a really productive form of interaction. Um, in the MOOC, especially uh, for me, Twitter was, a, was an important way to, to staying in touch with people. Just providing another kind of way to cut through the noise. Uh, the classes are so massive and so diverse inside and there's so much chatter happening. In my case, almost 100,000 posts in the forums in five weeks that sometimes those parallel channels of information sharing are actually more effective at getting the people that are the most engaged to come back and try things again. Anna? Um, I think uh, for me also Facebook was extremely useful within the MOOC um, and it created such a tight uh, community of people who were sharing ideas and I really like that and um, I think in art it's extremely important for students to interact and to encourage one another so I will definitely be incorporating that into my own teaching and creating a an online, a, a Facebook group that's specific for the course. I think a lot of students would benefit from it. And I think for me, changing the tone, uh, being more encouraging in the wording of things, um, I think my, the rubrics that I use right now for grading are very specific and detailed, but I changed them for the MOOC because I don't want to sound as harsh since it's not an equivalent to in the university level course. And I really like that and I think um, just changing the wording and being more encouraging and warm and inviting at the, you know, while still evaluating them fairly um, is something that I'm going to incorporate into my own teaching. Thank you. So we have a, another question that says, uh, it started with why you taught the MOOC, which we've already covered, but then there was also what sort of support or incentives did you receive from your college or department in order, in order to do this? And from across the university, actually, I, yeah. I look back. This person also yeah. realizes there were <clears throat> incentives or support provided beyond your own department and college. So, what sort of ab what abnormal forms of support did you receive, or incentives did you receive to do this? I have a very um, forward-thinking uh, boss, uh, Ann Taylor, who was willing to let me do this as part of my normal job. Um, so I, I added it on to what I do. I kind of carved out some time where there wasn't any. Uh, I stopped doing some small things that I do uh, normally, but at, on a normal basis, I kind of set my own teaching load in my unit, so I'm in a very unique position. Um, like I said, I'm not, an, I'm not a normal professor. Um, <laughs> so yeah. a lot of people want to know, they're like, how many classes did you get off? And I'm like, none, because uh, I just, because I get to decide that every year. I think that's called prioritization. I've heard about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to consider um, that now. I'll be honest with you. I, I mean, it's, it's a ton of work to make one and a ton of work to teach one, and it's very, very intense. And then afterward, there's all kinds of things you have to do as well. Um, but, uh, but if I had been, you know, I guess I could have asked for some more money. It doesn't seem like a, a huge, if that's the motivation, then don't teach a MOOC. I guess that would be my guidance. You're, you're, it's a really bad way to make more money because <laughs> you're going to work 40 times as hard as you ever have. Um, so it's not efficient. Um, just do something normal. Uh, but in terms of support and incentive from the university, there was tons. And our, we had our MOOC strategy group meeting that we still have every month um, where all of us who are working on these things kind of get together and talk shop about what was happening. 
um, I got the sense that there was a ton of support from, from central administration to make sure that these were successful. And that's followed up now and making sure that we did a good job <laughs> checking on us now before we run again. Um, certainly within my unit, I had the support of a learning designer, uh, Aaron Long, who did a lot of uh, work on making sure the course would work. And I know all the rest of us had teams of people um, that were helping out. Mine was relatively low budget as things go. So it was uh, me and learning designer and a little bit of part-time video assistant help, but I shot the videos myself and did a lot of the content uh, additions myself. I wrote everything, did all the graphics. Um, so there, there are various models and I, I kind of piloted that one, I guess. <laughs> So, so in addition to the, the, the support you were talking about coming from ETS and TLT and, and the instructional design support that we got, which was fabulous, um, the College of Engineering in our case um, also footed the bill for WPSU, uh, did the, the, the you know, fancy videos, and that was fabulous. Working with WPSU was absolutely phenomenal. We loved that experience. Um, I, I didn't get any course release for doing this, and I didn't get any supplemental pay for doing this, but I knew that ahead of time, and I, 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 I did it because I wanted to do it, so that was not, that was not the driver for me. But, um, you know, in our case, there, there were some things we wanted to do above and beyond, and we were very grateful to, to Jack Matson, who, who decided that some of his philanthropy to the university would be to our course, and, and that was fantastic, and we want to thank Jack for that. But a lot of moral support, so, you know, from the college, from Dean Wormley and, and Dean Engel, a lot of moral support in terms of this is fantastic. Um, supports from, from colleagues who were interested and, and intrigued by what we were doing, so there was a lot of, of that kind of community uh, bolstering when you were up at 1 a.m. answering forms because I just couldn't stop myself. It was just too exciting. Yeah. And, and Coil, we had money coming in from Coil and, and fabulous support from people like Kyle who were always being a cheerleader um, for us all the time. Anna? Um, I also wasn't compensated for this project, but I, because as we were talking about priorities, I just kind of made it part of my work, of my schedule. Um, our MOOC was offered, <coughs> the art MOOC was offered in the spring, uh, so kind of after this, in late spring, summer, so it worked out for me. I wasn't teaching anything at that time, so I was really able to commit my time to the MOOC. Uh, we had a really amazing team of people. We had um, Gary Chin from eLearning, interim director of eLearning Institute, and he was the, lead, the project lead. Uh, we had Angela Dick from, is she here? Um, hi, uh, from TLT, she was an instructional <coughs> designer on the project. We had uh, Cody Goddard, Goddard, who was our videographer, and we had also a teaching assistant provided by School of Visual Arts, Amy Bloom, who is a PhD candidate in art education. Um, all of us worked very, very hard because we were the first MOOC to come out. We had a super short amount of time to customize the material to the MOOC requirements. Um, but you know, it was really incredible, and we all worked together, and we encouraged each other, and I think that's why it turned out well. Thank you. To, mm -hmm. <coughs> to others outside this room, uh, that list of people helping might seem like a long list. People inside this room know what it takes to put together a quality course, mm -hmm. so they're not surprised at all. To the people outside who may see this stream or, or uh, want to think about it, imagine that small team of people producing a course that reaches more people than all the other professors teaching that course in the world at that time, right? So you have one course. Some, some people think of these numbers and, and uh, you know, sort of dismiss them. Well, they started with 100,000, but they end up with only 6,000. Only 6,000. Wait a minute. That's 6,000. How many sections is that of a course? Mm -hmm. And how, you know, how much good have you just done around the world? And so it, it takes a village to sort of create and run one of these. Uh, but when you look at the return on investment, uh, it's huge, not necessarily for dollars, but that brings mm -hmm. us to the next question. So, <laughs> so how do you see MOOCs sort of coming back into the Penn State landscape? So we have a great, you know, large residential program with campuses, and we have the World Campus, you know, an amazing uh, uh, component of Penn, what Penn State is to the world. And now we have MOOCs. So how does, do you, have you, you've obviously given some thought about how that comes together, and is there a contribution back into the rest of Penn State? Where do you see it all fitting? So 
My class was actually uh, designed to fit a role as a gateway into er, my existing rural campus delivered programs. So it, it doesn't really explicitly say that anywhere, and I was, uh, much like Anna talked about last night, there's just tacit linkages to the programs that we offer and what we do, and um, it's about visibility overall, and very, very few times I sort of said something about, this is not what I do for my day job. <laughs> you know, here's what I do for my day job if you're interested. And that's actually led to a substantial uh, increase in interest in our programs, for sure. Um, <clears throat> some new students that we're aware of already, and I'm going to work on ways to assess that soon. Um, excuse me. So uh, I'm, I'm very positive on these as ways to enhance the visibility of our university, of our colleges, of our department's strengths um, as a way to get people in the door a little bit. Um, get them excited about Penn State, understand what it is we do that's different and better than other schools. I think they're uh, quite possibly uh, the, the most excellent current way to do that for if you're looking to get totally different new audiences anyway. Um, I don't think that they are replacements for the vast majority of normal online teaching that we do to small sections of people, and especially in graduate courses, and I don't think they're going to take over all of our general education or anything crazy like that. So in addition to the visibility piece, I want to um, note something that Kyle was talking about last night, which was the, the, the use of badges for learning, so competency-based learning. And I think that MOOCs could very well fit into the Penn State landscape that way by providing students with certain skills that they might learn and badges that they might earn within the MOOCs that could then be added up from other sources, getting badging that would perhaps, maybe it's a, um, so they could test out of a course, or maybe it's so that they could, um, you know, come into say a math sequence at a higher level, or or something like that. So, so like you, I don't see them replacing our bread and butter, but I see them enhancing it. And I can imagine too, you know, students who maybe are struggling with a particular subject or a particular course, and a MOOC being the way that they can not only focus and learn that material more, but engage with people outside the university who know that material. So when we talk about students teaching each other within the MOOC environment, um, imagine a student who's, who's struggling with math and going out into a math MOOC and talking with people who are practicing math and applying it all over the world and having them say, yes, you know, this really is important. It really is important that you learn this topic and here's how I use it every day and, and let me help you because the students are amazingly generous with each other. So I can see it as being enhancements um, in all of those different ways. And I know the issue of monetizing MOOCs is, is on everybody's mind. And I don't know exactly how it's going to work out, but, but I know that with every other new technology I've ever seen, whether it was online or not, people will find a way. They will find a way to make it, to monetize it in, in valuable ways. But we have to provide value. And, and I think we do. You just got out of all the good stuff. <laughs> We'll start with you next time. <laughs> I think enhancing is a really good word. I really agree with you. And visibility. Um, our The digital arts certificate program is really tiny. And while we were running a MOOC, we had so much traffic and people uh, inquiring about applications. Uh, we've never seen that many. So that was just, <coughs> that was good for us to, you know, put that information out there. Um, also, as I mentioned yesterday, we were sharing videos. Um, of the faculty from the School of Visual Arts talking about the school, talking about the professors, the students. So putting information out there about what we have to offer and letting students know that we have this great university and education here. Thank you. The questions are really pouring in now. Thank you. Uh, the next one might be even a better question for Bart, but maybe you'll be able to answer it here. Uh, Mark Purcell is uh, in charge of the sort of, he's, I call him the data steward. So he's the one who makes the data from Coursera about all our, our MOOCs uh, accessible, which is a big job, a much bigger job than it sounds. But the next question is, uh, do you know if your students were primarily adult learners mm -hmm. or traditional college or a mix? And I'm going to sort of en enhance that to say, what do we know <coughs> about the people who took our courses? Mm -hmm. And I'll let you take a swing at it. Bart, if you want to take a swing at it, I'll give you the, you want this, you, yeah, okay. I think we had the mix. Uh, we had, but there were a lot of students who were educated. Um, there were a lot of students who were new to art, and some were experienced. Um, we we had some, um, you know, tables that showed that, which I don't have with me right now. But I think it was a mix. 
How about we, we take some of that data and put it in the Yammer uh, site yeah, the that Drew told you about? So we'll, we'll get some of those charts and, and post that in the Yammer site. So that's a really good question, which probably can't be precise. but I know, know. I know a little bit about my class. Um, so I, one thing that surprised me was that, uh, and I should have known this if I had researched MOOCs a little bit more, but I've been making one, so I didn't have time. Uh, I'm about 70% of the students in my class identify themselves as being male. Um, so my class was really... So it sort of shocked me how male it was. Uh, I mean, I wasn't I was expecting it to be closer to 50-50s given how geography typically is in America. Uh, my suspicion is that South Asian students were almost entirely males and very, very few females from that part of the world. And there were a lot of South Asian students in my class. So I'm looking now at sort of tearing apart that geography a little bit and looking at the geographic differences in my class a lot more. The uh, age range is question is a really good one. Uh, my impression is that the majority of students in my class were in the 30s kind of range. It's not um, the case in my course that the majority or even a substantial minority were sort of typical college age students. Um, they were, they tended to be older. Great, and I think that was similar for ours. We're just getting the, the data from, from the Creativity MOOC, but I think early on we had a sense that they were, you know, over 20. Um, the average was over, tw between 20 and 40, let's say. But we definitely saw a range. I mean, there were some groups sure. in the forums that formed, there was a group of, of seniors, they were 80 years old and older, that were working together. And then we had high school students. And, and it was cool to see that diversity of learner that I would never see here. But, but the sense was they were adult learners. countries just have one person, right, representative of one of the groups, but it's a pretty interesting split. Uh, the U.S., I think, makes up about a third of our population enrolling in our groups. So it's a really, really uh, radically diverse group of students, which is really interesting. Thank you, Bart. So here's a real nice meaty question. So how did the peer assessment or feedback work in your course? Do you think it was valuable to the participants? Could you see this model of feedback working in a credit-based course? Well, um, in my course, that was the whole point because students were evaluating each other, each other's work. Um, I created a rubric they they had to fill out, which I'm going to revise and make it much more detailed because that's what the students wanted. And then they would provide one another with personal feedback that they would write within the rubric. Um, some students took it very seriously and they would spend hours, they would have to review only two people, some of them would review 30 people at a time, just because they really like looking at each other's work and providing each other with suggestions. Um, there were, of course, students who didn't take it seriously and would write something mean or, you know, it would upset other students. So it created some conflict within the course. Uh, why isn't somebody taking my work seriously? Why am I not getting a fair evaluation? But I think overall it was really effective. So maybe placing a more detailed rubric in place, providing very specific instructions and examples of a proper way to critique each other, I think will make it stronger. I really like that aspect and I'm definitely thinking of incorporating it into my own course here. Um, it, it was just, I think, the, the basis of the course and I can't imagine within an art book not having with the, with the creativity MOOC, we actually decided to experiment with assessing things a slightly different way. We knew that the peer assessment, you had used the peer assessment and other MOOCs were as well, and we said, we actually had a, a COIL grant to, to experiment a little bit with kinds of assessments. So rather than using the peer assessment, we gave the students the option of using the discussion forums as an assessment forum. And part of the reason was, in the creativity MOOC, we were trying to teach them a process rather than content mastery. So we were more interested in were they following the process of generating ideas and selecting ideas and implementing things. There wasn't a right answer to have and, and we also felt we, we just wanted to experiment. So there were some positive things about using the discussion forums in that students felt um, I think a little bit less pressure to, to do the assessment in a particular way, but then again there were students who wanted more instruction on that. So I know that we're thinking about for the next iteration of our MOOC, 
um, again, experimenting with the peer assessment that Coursera has and they're actually working on and adjusting and several other methods of assessment. So that's something that for us is a, is a research area. one's on either. Um, yeah, uh, we use peer assessment in my class for just one of the assignments. Uh, the last assignment, which is to make a map to tell a story. So it's kind of a final project. It's up to the students to gather some data now that they know how to make their own maps. I uh, wanted them to tell a story with one and critique each other in, in very basic ways about the design of that, the effectiveness of the storytelling, and, and some, some other basic aspects. Um, I found that uh, assignment to be one of the most stressful for me to administer as the teacher in the course. Uh, because uh, I underestimated how many students actually know what peer review is. Um, I assumed that MOOC students knew that that was part of taking MOOCs, um, and most of them did not. So I needed uh, to step back a lot and say, okay, here's how this works, here's the evidence for why you use this method, because uh, some students were like, this can't possibly be a way to teach. Um, so I, I kind of had to fight against that a little bit and establish that it, it was a valid method for <clears throat> scaling up uh, interaction in a course like this. Um, I found it to be really valuable. You know, a lot of the students who are the most skeptical about doing it then said something later to the effect of, like, I just reviewed 30 other projects, just like Anna said, and this was good, like the best part of the class for me because I got to see what everybody else made. Um, so I really felt that it was a positive experience. I'll do it again. Uh, we've been using peer assessment of various forms in our normal online classes in the Dutton Institute and EMS for a long, long time. Um, so for me, that method, that, that's another reason why I kind of was like, well, we'll do peer assessment, of course. Um, so it didn't surprise me at all that that was an option, and uh, like I said, I just needed to do a better job of communicating to students as to how that method works, why it, why you use it in a class like this, and um, I, I do think it's, uh, on whole, it's worth the sort of pain of delivering it, um, because a lot of the students who take it seriously cite that as one of the most positive aspects of the course afterward. Thanks. Now, I'm going to throw one in, sort of a, a curveball here. What is it that you, as director of COIL, co-director of COIL, what is it you want to know that you don't know? In other words, what questions do you have now uh, that could be answered through research or, or what? I'll just leave it at that. None. It's all perfectly clear. <laughs> let, the, let the record show that they, they. How can we scale assessment from me to the class? For real, not not necessarily peer assessment, because I actually would like to grade the maps. <laughs> so let's. I mean, that uh, one thing that uh, kind of resonated with me with both uh, some of the things that Anna and Catherine have both said today um, is that there's this perception that if you teach a MOOC, you can't possibly interact with people and you can't do these things and you can't can't can't. And I, I'm really motivated when people tell me I can't do things. So I, I just. I, <laughs> A part of me wonders, like, is it really, Im is it actually impossible uh, for me to grade things in some way that's meaningful and, and we get a lot closer anyway to what, what I do with 20 people in a class? Is that actually impossible or is it just impossible right now? Um, so there, that's a really hard one. Thanks. And you, you can't give me 20 bucks. Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see, I'd like to, 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 to learn how far can we push um, learning beyond content mastery with a MOOC. So content mastery is, is probably the easiest thing to scale up. I present written material, I present videos, and I, and I see if you get it. But we were very focused on experiential learning in our MOOC, and I think we would like to push that even further. How can we, what's the best way to assess that and make sure that the students are actually having the experience you want them to have? And how far can we push, you know, I really admire you getting them to do physical artwork and things in an engineering sense. How far can I push experiential technical learning using a MOOC format? I would love to see how far we can push students to do inventing and experimenting and, um, and things like that that we think can only happen in a lab. I'm like you, Anthony. Don't tell me it's impossible because I'll go try it. Yeah. Um, how far can we push that? Anna, anything for you? both of the things they said. Um, it would be interesting to have like a closed off MOOC where there aren't so many people. I mean, a lot of people, but not so many people. So it would be more of a controlled environment. Um, mm. I think they're planning to do that with music right now. Um, and Clemens is. Well, one of the things that. Penn State's looking at is the massive open credit course yeah. or the massive 
I don't know how open it would be because you wouldn't, it wouldn't be free anymore, but Just the Massive on, Credit Course. Massive, massive, massive online massive. credit course. Yeah. Massive yeah. online credit course. So that's one thing we're looking at is about scaling up and how can we scale up assessment and all those things. So we have an interesting question here that says, is it really about MOOCs or is it just about Penn State trying new and innovative things? Today it's MOOCs, tomorrow it may be something else. I, sure. Go ahead. Yes, <laughs> go ahead. Yes. I mean, I, I, yeah, that, that doesn't, I, in a lot of ways, like the, the MOOC strategy group we've been meeting with, we now are in like other kind of topic areas that are related to this, and that's been one of the discussions we've had is, where does this discussion keep going forward? Um, because we've ended up talking about other models for distance education, the massive open, uh, massive online credit course, I agree, that there's no possible way you can call that open anymore, <laughs> unless it's actually free. Uh, and even then, that's partly defined by open. So uh, I, I think there, there's uh, this meeting and uh, plenty of others that are happening here on campus and a lot of the other units on, on campus. We have tons of different e-learning units, including World Campus, but uh, you know other college level units too are really focused a lot on innovative things in distance education, and that was, to my understanding, the reason to try MOOCs at Penn State was to see what they can do and what they cannot do uh, and be strategic about it. So I think it is about innovation, and it wasn't actually about necessarily MOOCs. Thanks. Before Penn State got into MOOCs, I, I had the opportunity to visit Duke University, which is one of the first five Coursera partners. And what I discovered there, I asked them, why did you do it? And they said, well, we're a research one institution. Our business is education. You know, this is an innovation in our business, and we're a research institution. We feel it's our obligation to be conducting research. We can sit back and let other people do the research, or we can study, you know, how better to do, conduct our business. Let's find out the answer to all these questions. So I think that that's a really good question, and, and my answer would be it's not really about MOOCs, or it is really about MOOCs now, <laughs> and it's really about other opportunities for us to do our, do our job better. Drew, are we out of time? Is, Ten minutes. Okay, good. That, that reminds me of, of, you know, do you want cherry pie or chocolate cake? And my answer is yes. <laughs> and, and so I agree with you. I think um, we are a Research One University, and we, when I walk into my face-to-face -face classroom, I'm, I'm walking into a laboratory, I'm walking into a learning laboratory. It doesn't matter if I have five students in the room or 30 students in the room or 130,000 students in the room, I should be learning about what I do as an educator. And so we can't, we can't not look at this as a technology, but it's just, it's one of, a, it's one of the many that we'll continue to look at. Um, I, really, I really like the fact that Penn State is is pushing the envelope with, with the other prestigious universities in this country. And I'm really proud of Penn State for doing this. Thanks, and when you think about it, I mean, we're at Penn State, we have over 100 instructional designers on staff working in the World Campus and Earth and Mineral Science and Arts and Architecture and other places. And we are a great place to really use this. When uh, I, I talk to people about big data and about data analytics and MOOCs, <clears throat> when you offer a class and it has tens of thousands of students in it, when you open week one, you know, on day one, you've had 3,000 people approach a learning activity. And you can see, you know, for whom it worked and for whom it didn't. Mm -hmm. You can offer, they, they offer, like to do A, B. You know, we're going to offer this in two different ways to people. And all of a sudden, as soon as you open the gates, you've had thousands of people run through. And if you have some, you know, if you get them to do a survey first, you know some demographic information, information about whether English is their primary language, you know, maybe background in the field and so on. And there's just awesome opportunity here. Unfortunately, the data uh, come in in a very uh, unfortunate way, and there's a, lot, there's a lot of work that has to go on before we can do a lot of that. But I think, uh, you know, there is a real opportunity. Talk about a learning laboratory and scale. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really, uh, I think, marginally tapped potential. And we're in contact with people at Stanford. There's a Lytics lab that is a, a bunch of doctoral and uh, postdoc students primarily with the professor uh, chairing it that's really doing some interesting work in, in looking at Stanford's MOOCs, not necessarily Coursera's MOOCs, but Stanford also is running MOOCs through Coursera and elsewhere. And uh, it's a really interesting time in the history of online education. And we will be learning the curve 
will get steeper. Uh, the progress and effectiveness curve will get steeper as a result of this. Other thoughts? Any questions from the audience? Maybe somebody didn't have a device. I don't want to, uh, I want this to be accessible to the people who have a voice but not a, not a digital device with them. Any questions or comments from the field? Jack, come on up and you can take the mic, please. Jack Matson, uh, professor and ringleader of the creativity MOOC. <laughs> have you ever been called that before? No, ringleader sounds like outlaw. And, may, and, and maybe to a certain degree we were in this course. Here we're teaching a course in creativity, innovation, and change out of the engineering college, which if you think about it, it has, it's psychology, it's everything. But we're human beings and that's what we have been teaching, innovative design and so forth in engineering. So it became quite natural to us to uh, extend. We did have a, a clinical psychologist also, John Belanti involved in looking at the change aspect and because once you become more creative, you're changing yourself significantly. And we had to warn the students and also uh, uh, have forums basically dealing with this aspect of, of not only behavioral change, but a change in their community. If they're trying to innovate uh, for some social reason, uh, that creates change and there's always resistance to that change and how do you, you handle it? So these questions came up as we were innovating on the course and from week to week. I suspect uh, in the other MOOCs too, there was this, uh, what's happening this week and maybe we better go in this direction rather than that direction based on the kind of instant feedback you get. And also I think all of us uh, flipped the course in terms of what we call flipping. In other words, we present the material uh, on Sunday and then we would have some Google Hangouts, at least two Google Hangouts, where we'd have students involved asking questions and so forth. So that was kind of our classroom where it was through Google Hangouts. So all of this was going on now. We're going to experiment with a Penn State course this spring, a freshman seminar course, where we're going to blend it. Because the kind of course we have can be blended into practically any academic situation. And also, Penn State has moved toward entrepreneurship minor in every college, including the branch campuses. And so this would be a nice course to blend into that minor, but we're gonna experiment with these freshmen in terms of how do we blend it and how is that blending going to work? It's going to be face-to-face, -face, but they're gonna use our MOOC platform to do it. Also, we've decided, and Coursera wants to, that our MOOC is still open. We're passive about responding on it, but people can go in and take it informally. They can watch the videos. It's like having an ebook there that they can just pull off the shelf. And then one other thing we're doing, uh, which I think will provide more insight to us, because we really want to dissect this MOOC and find out what really worked, what the failures were, what we learned from those failures. So uh, we have now 70 submissions of what happened to you in the course, what changes did occur and what caused those changes. And we hope to take the best of those and each of us faculty members also write a chapter in what will be an ebook that will serve as kind of a textbook for the, the course next fall. So, that's kind of another part of the project that'll both give us insight, but give something tangible at the end that everybody that submits will have their own chapter and their own credit for, for doing it. So that's an, a, another exciting thing that's, that's going on. But I wanted to bring up this question of blending mm -hmm. and what the possibilities are there and, and whether that's being considered. That was my real question. Thanks. Anybody want to answer that question? I, I'll say that uh, Sebastian Thrun in one of his early MOOCs on computer science did that. He had his Stanford class, <clears throat> he made the MOOC available to his Stanford face-to-face -face class while he had it open to 120,000 people. This was one of the first AI artificial intelligence courses. 
And one of the interesting things he found was that his attendance in the face-to-face -face class dropped off, that many of his face-to-face -face students did take advantage of the MOOC. But he also found that there were 250 students in the world that outscored his top resident Stanford face-to-face -face student. So, you know, you talk about the quality of, of the people out there and the, the variety of the people who are in that course. So there were some who obviously didn't even have the prerequisites, but, you know, it's, it's quite a, an opportunity to, to blend. Imagine if those 250, uh, you know, people who actually were as capable or more capable were part of a community, you know, talking to each other and supporting each other. Uh, that, that could really be quite an advantage to merge other bright, very capable people who have an interest um, with the people in your resident class. And I think I know in, in the College of Engineering we're trying to encourage more um, global um, interactions, our students to, to interact globally. And I think this is a great way to do that. So even if you only send your students into your MOOC platform for pieces of it along the way, um, it, it, maybe they can't go visit and live in France or England or, or Germany for a semester. Maybe they can't afford it but they can interact with students from many other countries and cultures this way as, as part of blending into another course. And I think that, that helps them and it helps the folks in the other country learn more about us. I think it would be extremely important for them. I think it would really inspire them and push them and challenge them. Um, I think that would be a great idea. I think it would really work for me. Okay, any other questions? If not, there's one that came in about an hour ago that I saved for last. <clears throat> that was if you had to do it all over again, and I'm gonna change that to when you do it over again, uh, what would you change about the MOOC that you taught? In other words, what, what are the things on your list of, next time I'm gonna do, hmm. I'm gonna work on uh, introducing the peer assessment like I mentioned earlier, making sure that people understand what that is, why we're doing it, the evidence behind using that method. That's one thing I wanna work on. Um, I want to leverage the content that was created in the first class. So there were almost 100,000 posts in that first class, and many of them were really useful and interesting. I'm still trying to figure out how I might leverage that in a way that doesn't sort of de facto shape the next conversation that happens, but I do feel like I don't want to waste that uh, effort. It's, that's a huge corpus of information. Um, a really simple thing I want to do is talk about time zones right away. And say, and say if you refuse to understand which time zone you live in and how UTC time works, then I can't help you. <laughs> you know, I just, because there were, I mean, I got a lot of email from people that were frantic at deadlines who, you know, their grandparents suddenly died and all kinds of things happened um, due to deadlines. And so I'd really like to get past the logistical barrier of deadlines in some manner in the course and be creative with that. I know in, in our MOOC we, we talk about being in the forums and being present, and I think, Anna, you were talking about that last night. I would like to see in our MOOC more, of, I'll call them teaching assistants, um, and, and one of the wonderful things that Coursera offers is something called community TAs. So they will go out now, and they'll, they'll do the, the, the um, detective work and identify the students that did the best in your class, and then they will invite them to be community TAs to help you um, answer questions in the forums and to interact. And so I think that's an important component for us because, again, it gives you presence. And Jack mentioned the, the entrepreneurship minor that's now going across the university. And because I think we were all in a race to, to get material there on time, entrepreneurship is something that we would like to, to add into the Creativity, Innovation, and Change MOOC um, to a higher extent. So in terms of content, we'd like to add that in. Yeah, it would be great to have more help TAs or community TAs. And I think Anthony and I talked about this before, that some people were so involved in the MOOCs that they were already like uh, sort of TAs who were helping people out. And they were on the discussion forums 24-7, constantly commenting at night, all times of the day. Um, so that would be great, having consistent help and having presence within the course in addition to myself. Um, but also revising a lot of guidelines, providing a lot more depth and uh, detail, I think, will work for me because I learned that the students really want to know more. Mm -hmm. And they want to read long emails and they want to have more depth <laughs> in the rubric. And so I will definitely be providing that. Thank you very much. Drew, we have time for one more on the side. Okay. 
He's, he's coming. He's on his way. He's got one. His, his microphone is approaching you. The microphone is approaching you rapidly here. <laughs> about more information about this entrepreneurship minor that's across the university. Where, where is that housed? And is, are there prerequisites? Or where do we see that information? Is it open to every student, every major, every minor? Well, Liz Kissenweather, I believe, in, uh, I think Liz is the, Liz Kissenweather is the faculty member that I know of that is heading it up. But Jack can make more comments. <laughs> Uh, uh, yes, uh, Elizabeth Kissenweather in the department called SEDTAP in the Engineering College is heading it up, but it is a university-wide initiative. Uh, right now they have it uh, firmly in place in five different colleges at Penn State, and they're extending it to the 12 colleges this year, and then it's supposed to go out to the branch campuses, That's and right. I think you're going to yeah. be working. Great Valley, Abington, and Brandywine uh, are already on, talking. Uh, to extending look. it, and it's it's a minor. What you basic what students basically do is they, they is they take courses that they get credit for, either GA credit or they take their electives in their majors. So uh, I think four of the six courses are handled as part of their regular curriculum, they just have to decide that they want this entrepreneurship minor. And this came about about four or five years ago when the university realized that we're really entrepreneurs irrespective of what their majors or minors were. And of course, these are the alumni that contribute better, so there's that kind of incentive. But in this changing uh, world today, it's good even if you're not an entrepreneur to understand the basic concepts. Like we talk about monetizing here, and that's going to be a significant factor as to how to monetize these courses, because uh, I suspect that the, if you add up all the concentrations, it probably cost a million dollars, would be my incredibly rough estimate for, if you look at everybody, everybody's so-called free time and all the staff help and, and colleges and so forth. So it's an expensive activity. And so how do you monetize it? How do you integrate it into uh, world campus? So there's, we call it entrepreneurship. Uh, but the principles are basically the same. You're entrepreneuring inside the university. And so it's good and healthy. We know in the engineering college we've had the entrepreneurship minor for over a decade. It's a very popular minor. Uh, and it allows students the flexibility to understand in today's world there is no real job security. The job security is what you have up here, the skill sets you have, and so forth. And so that's important in this badging concept. That can't be underemphasized in terms of how do you develop credentials. Right now, you just get a certificate saying you took the course, but it doesn't tell you anything about the quality of the work you did. And so badging, I think, is going to become an important part. So all these things come together. Uh, finishing off your question, uh, right now, there are a number of students who are in the uh, entrepreneurship minor here on campus. And I can see it going to world campus. As a matter of fact, we're considering or we're going to say that our creativity, innovation, and change course can really be a freshman seminar course online. We can make it that way. That would be very attractive, a one credit course. And you think of a 1,000 freshmen taking it at $500 a credit, and you've quickly monetized. And so that's basically the, one of the directions they're going in. Thank you, Jack. And I'd like to thank our panelists for uh, sharing their experience with us. Thank you very much. And thank you, Kyle, and everybody for, um, for the great conversation this morning. Um, we got a lot out of it. Well, I did. I, I'm not going to speak for everybody here, but I'm guaranteeing that everybody got something really good out of it. Um, so the w way the rest of the day is going to work, at 10 o'clock, the uh, concurrent sessions will be over um, in, in the other side of the building in the same spot. Back here at 11 o'clock, we'll hear from the students. Um, on our student panel, panel we have 10, uh, 10 to 14 students um, who have come from all over the country to share with us about their experiences as online students and then lunch is immediately following that. 
All right, so enjoy the rest of the day.
a little bit. Check, check, one, two, check, check, one, two, one, two. Check, check. This is Dean's dedicated one needs to come down. Check, check, one, two, three. Check, check, one, two, three. Check, check. Check, one, two. Check, check. Maybe down just a little bit more. Check, check, one, two, one, two. Check, 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 one, two, one, two. Check. That should be good right there. Unit one, check one, two, check, 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 one, two, three. That sounds good. Unit four, check, check, one, two, one, two, one, two. Sounds good. One oh eight, one oh nine, check one two, check check one two three, sounds good. <laughs> Dedicated President Hall one, check one two, check check one two. That sounds good. Uh, this one's not labeled. I think it's 93. Check one, two, check, check, one, two, three. That sounds good. Dean's Hall 2. Dean's Hall 2's love is a little hot. You can come down a little bit. Check 1, 2. Check, check. 1, 2, 3. Check, check. 1, 2, 1, 2. Check, check. Maybe bring it down a smidge more. Check, check. 1, 2. And actually right back up. Check, check. 1, 2. Check, check. 1, 2, 1, 2. Check, check. 1, 2. Check, check, that should be okay. This one also is not labeled. Uh, copy that, unit three can maybe come up a hair. Check one, two, check, check, that's good. Four, five. Yes, I am. This can come up. One oh four five can come up. Check, check, check. One, two, three, check, check. Maybe up a little bit more. Check one, two, check, check, one, two, one, two. Good. Banquet one, check one, two, check, check. A little loud, probably come down a smidge. Check one, two, check, check, one, two, one, two, check, check. <laughs> Should be good. <laughs> AT76, check one, two, maybe bring it down just a little bit. Check one, two, check, check, one, two, one, two. Should be good.
Unit two, check, check, one, two, three, check, check, one, two. Uh, should be good. One oh six seven can come down just a little, yeah, come down. Check one two, check check one two one two, check check one two. Bye. All right, good. And then the last one is banquet two love. Check one, two, check, check, you can bring it down just a little bit. 
Check one, two, check, check, one, two, three, check, check. That sounds good. Check one, two, one, two, check, check. They're all on. We should probably go back through and make sure not one of them is a little too hot. Check, check, one, two. Checkity check. One, two, check, check. Check, check, one, two. We need new things to check our mics with. Check, check. Go ahead, go ahead. Press one. Check, one. Check, check. Dedicated love can probably come down a little bit. Check, check, one, two, that sounds good. Banquet love, check, check, one, two, three. Sure, check, check, one, two. One, two. Check one, oh, four, five. Last but not least, Steen's two. Or actually not, Steve has one, two more. Get ahead, get ahead, get ahead. I like it. Check one, two. Can you hear me in the feed? All right. Check, check, one, two, three. Good. Okay. A uh, 108, 109 handheld needs to come up in the feed. Check, check, one, two. One, two. Good. All right. I think we're good. I think we're uh, in good shape. You turn, you turn it off, Steve. Yeah. I need some batteries. I only got one so far. Check one, two, one, two, check, check.
Check, check, one, two. Now you're not muted.
Let's go ahead and get started with the student panel. Okay. So my name is Richard Brungard, and I'm the Academic Support Resource Coordinator for Penn State World Campus. And about a month ago, Drew Tatusco asked me if I would help put together a student panel who could come and kind of talk about their experiences as adult online learners, and I told him I was glad to do so. And so we put a call out for students, and uh, we got a lot of students. So isn't this a great group? So this is how it's going to work today. We're going to go through and I'm going to ask the students a couple questions. I have a handful of questions uh, I'm going to ask them and hopefully the questions I ask will be some of the same questions that you might have already so they will have answered some of your questions. But then we're going to save plenty of time um, at the end or the second half of this for you to ask questions as well, any questions you have. So this is your opportunity to start thinking about while you have a whole panel of students here, you know, what would you like to know to make a better faculty person or to make it uh, uh, easier to design your course or, or what do you want to know that would make your course better okay so this is your opportunity so what we're going to do first is I'm going to have the students go down the row and introduce themselves so if you guys could just tell me your name where you're from and what uh, degree and major you're pursuing so everybody kind of knows who you are so who, which who wants to start first Nicole, okay. Hi, good morning. My name is Nicole Flynn. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Hello, good morning. My name is Nicole Swint. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. My major is IST, which is Information Sciences and Technology, and SRA, Security Risk Analysis. Hi, I'm Michelle Victor. Um, I'm from New York by way of Tampa. I live in Tampa now. Um, I graduated last year in information sciences and technology, so I'm an alum. I graduated with high distinction. <laughs> uh, good morning. My name's Ed Blackburn. Um, I'm from Philadelphia. I'm in letters, arts, and sciences, and my plan is to go into IST and SRA like Nicole. Hi, I'm David Kozak. I'd like to thank you all for coming here and, and showing us that you're interested in, in helping us have a better experience and, and for us to help you. I, I think it's a great opportunity to collaborate and, and make this virtual autonomous environment uh, a much better place for all of us. Um, so as I said, my name is David Kozak. I'm from Asheville, North Carolina. And I am studying business with a concentration in marketing and management. My name is Dee Bramson, and I am from Maryland, and I am majoring, I am doing an undergraduate degree in psychology. Hi, my name is Jimmy Hartano. Uh, I'm from Birmingham, Michigan. Hey, Jimmy, could you use that? Uh, that Mike and Dee's hand if yours doesn't work. Um, my name is Jimmy Hartono. Um, I'm from Birmingham, Massachusetts, and uh, I'm studying master's program in applied statistics. Good morning. Good morning. No. Yes. Okay. My name is Nabi Big, and I am from Miami, Florida. Little uh, weather's different over there than it is here. <laughs> Had a little shock when I came, um, and I'm in the MPA program, the master's in public administration. Hello, my name is Kelly Holcomb. I live just outside of, outside of Philadelphia and I'm pursuing a bachelor's in business focusing in marketing. Hello everybody, my name is LaShawn Hannon. I am the Jersey girl and uh, I have been a world campus student since 2008. So I completed the certificates in autism, ABA, and I just recently finished the master's in educational leadership or teacher leadership in um, August. Hi, my name is Ray Vasquez. I'm a uh, second semester student in the Bachelor of Science for Information in Sciences and Technology from Dallas, Texas. Again, bit of a weather shock, so not a fan of the snow. 
Hi, my name is Beth Fahey. I am from Pottstown, not Pottsville, where everybody thinks I, they want me to be from because of Yingling. Uh, and I am pursuing a Bachelor of Science in Psychology. Hi, I'm Naomi Mezzacapa, and I'm from San Diego, California, and I'm pursuing a Bachelor's in Letter Arts and Sciences. Hello, my name is TJ Stevens. I'm from Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, I am getting my bachelor's in business administration with a concentration in accounting. Great, thank you everybody. So let's go ahead with the first question and that is what's been the biggest benefit for you of, to be an online student? So what's the biggest benefit of being an online student for you? Well, I have four kids and um, I'm a stay-at-home mom, full-time student and the key, it's flexibility I think for all of us. It's, it, comes down to we can take our classes you know Monday through Sunday you have until midnight that kind of thing but it's the flexibility and being able to still go to the schools for stuff and um, go grocery shopping and that kind of thing for me it's been a matter of uh, being able to manage my time I uh, have clients that I have to travel to um, and so if I had to try and make classes uh, three days a week or two days a week, um, oftentimes there would probably be a conflict with when my clients would want to see me. Um, so for me, it's been time, being able to manage my time appropriately so that it's optimized. I think for me as a teacher, the best part and what's been most influential for me is what I'm able to take from being a student online to implement in my actual classroom. The idea of bringing distance to my brick and mortar school, I teach high school English, um, has really been the most beneficial part for me. I think Anybody? one of the things too, if I can jump in, uh, is doing in work, doing some of the light IT stuff around the office is actually being able to directly apply as opposed to you know waiting for the internship or waiting for the job after the fact being able to take okay just learn this and I can bring this right into what I do at work. Um, being an entrepreneur uh, my husband and I we own several businesses and um, pursuing my degree is part of a lifelong journey but it's also being a, flexible as well um, but it definitely um, is helpful in, in, in all different ways. So. I think for me, is, uh, the key is the flexibility itself. Um, when I started my program, um, I had a newborn, my first one. Actually, he was born first, and then uh, I, I postponed my, my start. But being that new father, uh, new parent, you know how it is with, with newborns, and they were waking up at night, not enough sleep. So um, I managed to study after the kids go to bed, and that flexibility that I have, if I were to take in a normal campus, I would spend time in commute that I don't have to do. I could just focus on work, I'll come home with the, with the family, and then also focus on studying when everybody goes to sleep. I, I just wanted to add that I like the portability of it, <coughs> that I can take it wherever I go. Um, and it doesn't matter if I am on a business trip, I can take it with me. I can take it with me if I'm on a long family vacation even though I might not want to, but I can. And, and that option is there. And, and just knowing that it's there makes it feel very um, satisfying. And it also kind of is a, it's kind of a nice bragging right, because I can be like, nope, sorry, I can't do that. I have homework, or <laughs> I have something to do. And it makes me feel kind of important when I get to say that, so. So on the opposite side then, what has been, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges of taking courses or being an online student? For me, oh, go ahead, Kelly. I think the biggest challenge for me has been the time management factor because there's so much, the workload is so much and the amount of reading, the time that it takes is just so much. So my biggest challenge has been trying to manage work, my son, and then getting all the work done that's needed for the, the amount of reading that needs to be done. I would also add to that um, the changes in technology. So one, one year you might have um, like Yammer or um, different advancements, and then the next semester something new comes along, and then you have to learn something new over again. Um, so the advancements in technology that are the rapid changes. I think it's group work. I, I, I would have to agree with 
Yeah, yeah. group work is, it's not fun. It really is. <laughs> um, because, you know, like for me, because I'm a stay-at-home mom, all my kids are in school. Um, so I, I have OCD, so I work Monday through Friday from 9 to 5. I mean, school is my job. Um, <coughs> and you have some people that don't like to do assignments until Sunday at 10 o'clock, and that does not work for me. So that whole group work thing, it's like, a, it's a great idea. It's just, it's not really good. I think, I think that um, what can happen, and you guys can tell me, so it adds to that group mm -hmm. work, and I think some professors are not going to like what I'm going to say next, but the things like um, the discussion forums, um, there seems to be like some, uh, what I call, scope creep, where it used to be where you could post <coughs> your work and then answer a couple of people. Now it's three or four posts plus your own work, and it can't just be a quick post. It has to be well thought out, which I appreciate. But it does add quite a lot of work every day. And it, what it's doing is it's not keeping, there's no flexibility anymore. You know, so now we're having to add work on top of work every day instead of giving us the flexibility during the week to do what we need to do. I think, so. I think that actually also might be dependent on your program. You know, my program that is very, you know, it, it requires a discussion. You're in the schools, you're learning, you're applying what you're learning in teacher leadership. Like it, it requires a discussion. You know, I think that might have to do with the program. I think, For, yeah, it just, you know, like you said, there's a lot of busy work. Um, and because most of us are working and having to do with family, we, w we need that flexibility. So in taking five classes and having every class require, um, so, and some, some professors will do uh, turning in work several times in the week, plus the discussion forum becomes less flexible. So you, you don't have that flexibility anymore. Could the issue be so, time management as well? I mean, I mean, I know that that's a, that's a big issue for students. You know, uh, you see a lot of students who get in over their heads by taking maybe four classes would, you know, be easier to, to, to get all the work done. Is, is that an issue? I'm is sure that, it's that's probably a challenge. A I know that's a challenge to, for people, Yeah, too. I'm sure it's probably similar to the challenges that both uh, a virtual environment as well as a brick and mortar environment has is, um, you know, how do you bring a sense of accountability um, and collaboration uh, to understand that it's the benefit of the whole, not just an individual. Um, now, I will say for me, my biggest challenge is um, I'm in a profession uh, that has 3,000 years of tradition. I don't use technology very much. I, I, I work with horses, um, and I take care of their feet. So I'm in a forge uh, shaping and, and molding steel. I have no use on a daily basis. Uh, for the use of a computer. A computer is not going to help me um, understand how to uh, help the biomechanics of the horse. Um, so my greatest challenge has been trying to, and I also, just a little bit of a background, um, you know, I, I remember the Apple IIe <laughs> and, and, and learning a, a basic word processing program on the Apple IIe and, and learning COBOL and some of these old, uh, Pascal, some of these old programming languages. Um, and technology changes so rapidly because I'm not involved in it on a daily basis. Until I became a World Campus student, I'm on the, I'm on the lower end of the learning curve trying to catch up. But what it has done for me is it has helped me shorten my learning curve by being involved in this virtual world and having um, in the undergraduate program, I, I have some students who are freshmen and sophomores uh, who actually go to one of the, the Penn State campuses and they've actually helped me to understand some of these social platforms that, that we can communicate on. And so on the positive side, it's actually helped me grow into this technology world that, that we're experiencing here in this 21st century. And so I'm finding this nice balance between how I can use technology 
to help me in what I do with my hands and horses? Um, I think that the um, horse thing, the, I think the horse thing, if they can do Invisalign um, braces using a computer and make these molds for people's teeth to, um, for adults and anyone of any age to um, straighten out their teeth. I think maybe there is not an application yet. There's not an app yet for the horse, but um, it soon come, you know. Um, my experience, um, the, the benefit of going to school online. Um, I graduated from high school at 16, and we used to have to type everything. I went straight to college then, and we used to have to type everything, and the whole citation thing just kind of eluded me. And um, now there's Google and all these <laughs> various sites and reference material that's online and all. Just it's it's just a richer experience, and I'm able to produce a higher quality of work than when I was originally in university. Um, but the flip side, if you're in a group project and there are some people who I've met some pretty shady folks online in, in the classes, and they have to do a peer eval. And um, they're giving their friends fives, which is the highest, and you know, you've upset them, so they want to give you a zero. And you did the, bu the bulk of the work, and they're getting an A. And, and you're, this, this peer evaluation is, is counting towards your grade. I think it's really unfair. I, what was helpful um, to me in one of my classes, the instructor, instead of giving, um, or probably in addition to giving the numerical, um, assigning a numerical grade to your peer, you had to write a narrative. I think that's very responsible. You need to say, well, this person did this really well. Um, this person could have done this a little better, or I really appreciated or did not appreciate something. And so you have to have some type of supporting documentation that goes along with the grade, not just, you know, yeah, I'm clicking, Chris, doing this Christmas tree thing, five, four, three, two, one, I'm done. You know, <laughs> submit. Yeah. That's. I'd like to add just one more thing. And, and this is the biggest challenge, and I'm sure everyone here asks the same question is, um, I enjoy human interaction and so how do we bring that type of psychological, those types of psychological emotions to a world or an environment that is autonomous? Um, and that's a challenge I face every day with, with my team members and with my professors is how do we get that human connection that, that just strengthens and builds the relationship within the online environment. I want to move on to the next question, but I think um, one thing David said that's, uh, one of the words you said I think that's key is balance, and I think that's something that, um, you know, I hear from a lot of students that it takes a little bit of time to figure out what is the balance? How do I balance my life? What is the right amount of work, school, and family life that is reasonable for me? And I think that I think every, I see a lot of heads nodding that that does take a little bit of time and that's hard, that's hard in the beginning especially to figure out what is my balance. The next question I wanted to ask is, um, so if a few of you could briefly tell me about a uh, course you took or tell me about a lesson or an activity within a course that you took that really helped you understand the concept, you know, uh, and, and maybe it was just a discussion group, maybe it was some multimedia thing that the, the faculty member had in the course, maybe it was a group project, I don't know, whatever it was, what is that, that, that lesson or that uh, activity that you did that really helped you understand the concept. Um, and if you could just take, you know, a few of you just take a minute and tell us about one. Um, I believe that uh, Yammer is a great tool. Um, it's very similar to Facebook, so you would post a photo of yourself and you can interact um, conversation-wise and do your post. And it's very com a very comfortable tool to use because a lot of people are familiar with Facebook and it's not, it doesn't feel very intimidating. Um, I really enjoyed when um, I had the opportunity to use in Gammer in the classes. I would say for me personally, it was my um, taxation course that I took with Professor Klein. <laughs> Professor Klein. Um, first of all, I love her. You can go ahead and put that out there. Woo! Um, <laughs> she, I like the fact that it wasn't about a textbook. Um, I have a very hard time um, taking theories and applying them 
And so in her course, she really does make it, um, it, it's based more off of real issues, real circumstances. And then you have to go and kind of investigate and find out. And I pre personally, I learn better that way. But yeah, the taxation course, applying real issues to an assignment that that's beneficial to me. I think anything that is rooted in a case study that is going to actually make you apply, research, investigate, troubleshoot, work with your partners while you're doing it, apply it to where you are. I think anything, all of the classes that I've had that somehow integrated the idea of case study and critical thinking and problem solving were, the, were by far the most meaningful. Yeah, I have to say, I, all, all of my professors that, that I've had ha, have found ways to take the academic theoretical information and develop lesson plans that help bring in a real world applicable experience. And, and that has helped me as well as my teammates to disseminate the information so that for those of us who are either looking to change careers into a new industry or, or just getting into our careers can go into the real world prepared with these skills that the employers are looking for, these critical thinking skills, the ability to collaborate and work in a team environment and to communicate effectively um, and how to communicate effectively. Um, I, I had one professor over my summer session one class. Uh, he taught international business. And, and I don't know how many of the faculty members do this, but in the brick and mortar, most of you, I'm sure, have office hours where you're in your office and you're open for students to either schedule an appointment or come in and meet with you uh, and talk to you about things. This particular professor did the same thing except in the virtual world. He put him, he made himself available one day a week on Blackboard Collaborate where he was there for two hours and students can come in and ask him questions, and, you know, whatever was on their mind, if they had questions about the assignments, questions about the information. Um, and it really helped a, a complex topic such as international business uh, seem much more down to earth and easier to understand. I have a different perspective to add. So my background is in engineering. Uh, for my undergraduate, I did in uh, brick and mortar schools. Um, now I'm doing my master's in applied statistics. And um, one of the biggest benefits that I, that I found is that in trying to understand the, the topics, there's a lot of uh, challenging math and calculations involved. And one of the benefits by doing it online is that there's a lot of video applets that is in the course, in the, in the uh, online um, materials, that you can rewind your professors. You can't do that in actual schools. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that actually is very helpful because um, if something is very challenging, you can rewind and try to understand what he's really trying to say. On top of that, this semester I had a professor, uh, Dr. Naomi uh, Altman. Some of the um, topic that she's trying to illustrate was not there yet. There's no video for it. And so she actually spent her own time at probably 11 at night and to create this little applet and just post it up, up there for the students to understand. And it was really helpful. I, I just wanted to add that I think when, when my professor is enthusiastic, I'm more enthusiastic. And that translates when you do your intro videos, when you do even your, your um, introductions on the syllabus. If you seem like you care about what you're teaching, I'm gonna be more inclined to want to hear what you have to say and what you're about to present to me. So I had one professor who each week gave us a little video intro to what the lesson about rights in America were gonna be that week. And it was great. I could tell he was sitting in his sunroom, in his house, and he was relaxed, but he was obviously impassioned about teaching us about rights in America. And I got that. I had another professor in an, in an energy conservation class who made a little, um, emoticon of himself or a picture of himself and he cartooned himself and he had himself walking through a house and how to check all of his appliances for LED you know, certifications and it was really, he cared. I could tell he cared and I could tell he was interested in what he was talking about. 
I wasn't really that interested in my hot water heater, but he made me care about my hot water heater. And, and, but that translates, and that's something that I can use. I'm a psych major. My water heater is not my primary concern, so it, was, it, it felt good, and that was a positive that I took away. And I got an A in the class, you know, and that I, prob I probably would have guessed that I might not have done that had I not seen those types of uh, exercises. I had a uh, professor for statistics, uh, Guy Kresge, and uh, he actually, I think he ran a business on the weekends, uh, but an hour before he opened the business, he would actually have a chat uh, with us, you know, fellow students, and um, in a way, you know, it showed that he cared, and he was taking time out of his own schedule, and um, in a way, I got to see where my fellow students were at in their class. It kind of helps you get a gauge of where you are when you see uh, fellow students not understanding a topic that you don't understand, so. Yeah, in a way, you know, otherwise you're just uh, autonomous and you don't really see where your fellow students are in their, you know, in the in progression. But um, number one, it showed that he cared. And number two, it, it helped me kind of connect with my uh, fellow students. I just wanted to say, um, can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, my current class for policy, uh, the professor, he set up this game. It was actually the, the coolest thing ever because we had to uh, set up a nation and what it would take to have a nation and people and that they have to be happy and resources and land and military. So it gave the whole perspective on this class and it was awesome. At the end, well, we're going through finals now, he gave a course reflection and I thought that was the greatest thing because it gave me the opportunity to see not only in the textbook because reading policy can be a little boring. So, but it gave me a whole perspective on how cool it was to play this game and then we played it amongst ourselves in the class. The other thing is, I know we talked a lot about the group projects and everything else. In, in, in my experience in the graduate program, there are those groups, they have you know the difficulties, the good ones and the not so good ones, but I can tell you that from my perspective, it's been really, really good. Because it does give an, op an opportunity for you to collaborate with other people and you have other feedback from your own peers when you're writing papers or doing group projects and I'd rather take that feedback first and then get the, the professors a little bit later because that way you kind of know what you're, you're in sync. And we use a lot of Skype, mm -hmm. we've used conference calls, we've used FaceTime and I've gotten to know some of my um, um, classmates through that way. So it's, it's been a nice experience. With um, the IST program, there's a class, um, Information Systems Design, and it, it approaches um, the, the matter from a human-computer interaction standpoint. And there, there's something to be said for how someone else is viewing this system that you've designed. You think, this is the best thing ever. It's wonderful, it does all this stuff. And the user is sitting in front of it and saying, wow, what a, an obnoxious font. I hate this color. Where, where's the menu? And so going through and systematically walking through each step of the design from the human computer interaction standpoint, it was extremely valuable because developers are not thinking about what the user is seeing. They're, they put it up there, it's beautiful to them, or it creates a paycheck, you know? Yeah, but they shouldn't have to stand on their head and paint their toenails while they're doing, you know, in order to get the output. So I think that was extremely valuable. I also forgot to mention, uh, I spoke to Brian Burns, who's here today, uh, yesterday at the reception, and. Uh, he talked to Nicole and us and went over some concepts for Math 22 on a napkin. So that's <laughs> probably for, for, for a good half hour, so it showed that he cared. So uh, talk about, um, you know, uh, several of you or each of you, talk about a, um, uh, just briefly, a, a professor that you had that, that you thought was exceptional. And what was it about that person that made them exceptional for you? I think Professor Klein. Seriously. I agree. I um, had a class with her. She is, um, she, her feedback is definitely personalized. Um, it, it, and she's critical, you know. She's very much like a tell it how it is person. And I love that. It's awesome. So she, she really does. She goes through your assignment and you know that she's reading it because she's nitpicking like little things out of your out of your assignments and she's like okay I don't know how you did this but this is how you do it and she and if you get something wrong she goes through it and tells you why it's wrong 
and that instead of just marking it wrong and then giving you your grade. Uh, and I think that that's, she's outstanding. Uh, I, would, I would have to agree and, and I would have to say all of my professors um, have been outstanding in that way in, in giving um, critical feedback, not just saying, oh, this is wrong, um, but saying, okay, well, here's a different way to look at it and this is why I, you know, I would like you to look at it this way. Um, I had a professor, uh, Dr. Mark Lennon, who, who is new to, I believe, the business program um, with World Campus. And he also, the reason why I, I pick him is because he would go one step further in the sense that he maintained sub, such an open-minded, objective viewpoint that he was willing to accept that he may not have all the right answers. And if you presented a point um, or made an argument that was valid and logical and supported that, even if he didn't agree with it or didn't think of it himself, he would comment and say, you're right, that's a valid point. I may not agree with it, but it's a valid point. Or, oh, I didn't agree, I, I didn't see that. That's, that was an excellent point you made. Um, and so it takes you from feeling like just this student-professor relationship to you're actually feeling like you're working with a fellow colleague for the, for the betterment of both of you. Hmm. I think I've had wonderful um, professors, but the one that stood out most is Dr. Akta. Dr. Akka. Um, I had her for IST class, and I'm, I've always done well in my classes, but this one particular semester, I failed one of my my exams by like a 46, which is unlike me. She actually went out her way to find out what was wrong, why I failed my tests. And I told her I didn't have any excuses. I didn't study, but in my personal life, I was having a lot of difficulties. My father was in the hospital, and so it was kind of hard to balance it. And she gave me the opportunity to retake the exam, which I did well on. And she stood out the most to me because she actually went a step further to see what was wrong. I got to say that the same. I think that I've had a very good experience with all my professors. Um, sometimes work does get in the way with school. Um, I work for the police department, so sometimes um, if there's something going on at work and I can't make it to, to do an assignment or I may miss it, I've been able to email my professors and let them know why. Um, you know, maybe uh, this is gonna hit the newspaper, this is what I'm working on, this really big case, and I'll send it to them, and everyone's been really pleasant about that. Um, grades, I mean, everything. Very good. For the uh, majority of my classes, uh, all my professors have been very helpful. They, they, they bend their, their, their backs towards us, and try to make it as collaborative as possible. So um, pretty much most of my, majority of my professors are very helpful to, for, for me to understand. Um, if I were to give a big shout out, it would be the advising staff. And the, the, the MES program, the Master of Statistics, is so well organized that for a new student coming in, um, I was out of school for 10 years after my bachelor's degree before I went to the certificate program. Um, and then the master's program, but it's so well organized, and they have uh, Dr. Mosuk Chow, who is the uh, advisors in the program, and she's very helpful in trying to help incoming students to understand about the structure, about the diff different options you can you, you can do. So um, not just the classroom, but also the support advising staff are great too. I think one of the things that's really helped out. Um, Kind of for, for the flip side of it is one of the questions about being an online student that other people who might be looking into it would ask is they wouldn't think it's all that personalized or what's the difference from just kind of picking up a textbook and just teaching yourself where you might not be able to reach somebody. And in uh, my ST 210, uh, Professor Haberling had, you know, done a lot of teaching. He did some of, you know, the traditional reading assignments. One of the things he did too is he did the demonstrations of the actual technical work that he wanted us to do for somebody who maybe more the kind of you have to show me and not necessarily tell me how to do things, like demonstrate these concepts, and you did really, really well with that. And it would be things that, you know, just staring at the assignment you wouldn't be able to get, but then once he kind of shows you, you know, the actual concept in action, then it kind of clicks and you get it. And also being very, very accessible, even outside of office hours, replying to emails on his phone. So it, it'd be at least to a student kind of the same perception of, you know, after a class, you run up to the teacher, you have a question about something, and that same sense, they're able to clarify it for you, as opposed to, 
you know, and, and I'd really encountered this, but somebody who may be more distant, who's difficult to reach, who may take a couple of days to get to you, so you sit and panic over the same thing. Dr. Rosalie Ocker, for me, also in IST, she, she was superlative, but there is another professor, STAT 483 system, um, um, statistical analytical programming, it's in the graduate school, and my advisor, academic advisor, she was not wanting me to take this class at all because it wasn't required, and, and, and so she was fighting me, not wanting me to take this course. And I think it's one of the best academic experiences I had in my life with Dr. Bruce Lord. He went above and beyond um, the, the, the whole teacher-scholar relationship. It was just beautiful. I mean, that's how I would expect um, you know, in, in an ideal world, the, the teacher has these exchanges with the student or the pupil, and um, he's, he's giving you and you're giving him, and it, it's a win-win for everyone. And he's going above and beyond, not just giving you the material and deal with it. He's telling you, well, there are different ways to do this, and you have all these other books, because we had like three textbooks, so you can see it from different, different people doing the same thing different ways, and yeah, he highlighted all that. I want to move to the next question, kind of looking at it from a different angle. Um, without naming any names, uh, tell us about a negative faculty experience that you had, and how it made you feel about yourself, or the course, or Penn State, and then what could that what could that faculty person have done so that it wasn't a negative experience? I don't think anybody intentionally wants to create a negative experience for students and, and things, you know, I think I think sometimes we do things not knowing the always the, the effect that it might have. So what was that negative thing? How did it make you feel and what what could they have just changed to make living it on a the positive West, experience? Living on the West Coast, it's a time factor. So um, when it's nine o'clock for me and my kids are in bed, it's twelve o'clock on Angel. And um, my assignment has to be in by 9 o'clock. So for me, from 9 to 12, those three hours are very valuable because I work during the week. And um, sometimes it's really stressful to have the paper in by 9 because I have dinner, getting everybody ready for bed, and then I'm like, okay, I've got, like a, I've got 45 minutes to get that assignment in. And I'm really nervous. Um, but the time, knowing the demographic time with the differences probably. I would have to say being graded, um, okay, for instance, I work on an Apple. I only have Mac in my house. Um, and some courses, like one in particular, um, the program that, they, that uh, was required was not set up for Mac users. Um, it wasn't cooperating. Um, so there were some answers that I could not produce because it didn't work for me. Um, and then being graded on that, it's just like, oh, basically I was told that's not my issue. You should buy a Microsoft and unless you, no, not doing that. So I think, you know, you have to understand it is an online course and not everybody has Microsoft products. So you have to kind of, you know, be flexible on that sense. I think sometimes as a teacher, I think sometimes I can forget that my students have other classes. <laughs> So my work is the most important. And I think that while I had a generally great experience in my 50 plus Penn State credits, um, <laughs> I think that sometimes instructors can forget that you're not just in their class, that you're also in your job and in your home and in your family and in three other people's classes as well. And I think um, if there's any tension that I've ever experienced, with a professor, I think it's because they forgot. <laughs> I think it's timeliness yeah. in responses. Mm -hmm. um, as a remote user, if you will, um, I rely on your feedback in a timely fashion. And if it's gone, you know, more than more than two weeks without any type of response from you, not that I'm seeking a grade, but I want feedback. I want to know what did I do well, what didn't I do well that I can focus on better on the subsequent two assignments that I've since turned in and still don't have a response from the third one two weeks ago. Um, you know, if I'm going down the wrong path, I want to know sooner rather than later. And that's where I, I treat it as if this is a professional experience for me as well. You know, I'm a, I'm a grown up and I have a, I have a job and, and my boss wouldn't accept that for me. 
And you know, I would expect the same from, from a professor, the common courtesy of a response. Even if it's a survey class, which most of mine have been so far because I'm still you know, kind of putting my feet in the water, it's still important. You know, it, it doesn't, doesn't make it any less important just because it's an, you know, an 021 or 022 class. It's still important to me to know. And so timeliness of response, I think, is one thing that, I have one, prof one professor in particular that was very poor at that. And it really stuck out to me and is, is really you know, tinging my experience to the negative. I just wanted to go back. I had uh, made that point about the discussion forums, and it, it's not, I, I don't want to say that um, that there are too many hours I have to spend working. It's just it becomes inflexible, less flexible. Each, if everything, if things are due every single day, and the more classes you take, and if everybody's doing discussion forums, and that speaks to um, the fact that professors you know, they think about their own class, but they're not understanding. I mean, a full course is five, full semester is five courses. That's what's recommended to finish on time. Um, and so it's not the hours, but the flexibility, you know. So you think it's more about the quality and not the quantity? Quality. Well, I just, um, so for those of us who have to work and go to school and have family, and that's why we're online, um, we need as much flexibility as we can. So it may be that we're on business trips and that we need n not to do work for two days and then we spend more hours three days. You know, we've worked it out where we've got Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday is what we've blocked off and that's what we need to do in order to get the work done. But. Um, as an example this semester, and it just happens to be that way, that's why I'm feeling it. Um, I am taking five classes and I've, I've, I'm really, I've blocked off enough time, but most of my work is, a lot of my work is due Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, which is hard to accomplish for me, you know, I needed, I needed the flexibility and that's kind of where I'm coming from. So I do, I have blocked up enough hours but I need to shift it the way that's good for me. That's I, I would like to add to that. I work mainly on the weekend. I do my schoolwork on the weekend. So I'm very busy during the week. And so a lot of the assignments, you know, maybe I might have uh, something due on Wednesday and I'm kind of stressing about it because I mainly do a lot of my work on the weekend. So that's also I would like to add about the flexibility is um, with adult learners. I know there's that the discussion always uh, that comes up once in a while is you know would it be better if, if everything was always due Sunday nights or would it be better if the class is staggered so maybe for one class you had things that were due Mondays another class you had things due Wednesdays another class you had things due Sunday. But how how would that work for you guys? What do you think is better? Or would it be better if it's all due Sunday night and I can spend all week working on it and I know I turn in everything in Sunday night. I think uh, Sunday. Uh, well, I, I was going to say, I don't know if, it, if you could make a blanket due date like that because yeah. we're all so different. I mean, you know, you're dealing with time zones, you're dealing with people in the military, you're dealing with people all over the place. And I, I don't know. I mean, I prefer that everybody does the same thing because then it's easy to keep straight in my head with all my, you know, if, if I know all my classes are due Sundays at midnight, I'm great. The, the, the tricky part is at the end of the semester because for some reason the semester ends on a Friday. So you jump, you, we, we back, you, get, you back us up. I missed a, I missed a deadline once. Okay, um, because I thought it was going to be due on Sunday because everything else that semester had been due on Sunday and all of a sudden my final was due Friday. Some, I, some, something that my professor in my class has do a lot is at the beginning of the semester, uh, he or she posts up the class schedule, including the due dates. And the students get to see it. And if some, some one or two students start discussing about due dates, the professor usually are very flexible in opening up a vote. Um, he's be flexible. When is a good time for you guys to submit um, um, assignments? And most of the times, it's gonna fall down to one or two days uh, through the week, which works for everybody. Um, that is almost no. I don't remember a class where everybody prefer Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. It's always just between one or two class, and people don't really have a very, very strong opinion. But it makes everybody feel like they're being heard about their situation, and that helps. I think, I, I'm sorry, uh, go ahead. I was gonna say, um, I actually, it, I, it, I don't think it would matter what, 
the schedule was as far as timelines. Um, I think the, the question is, as a student, how do you look at what you're being asked to accomplish and then making arrangements so that you can meet those deadlines? Because for, for me, um, taking it as an opportunity to learn how to improve my time management skills um, is how, in, instead of looking at it as, oh man, I gotta do this, Ugh, how am I gonna do this? I look at the other side of it and say, how can I get this done? How can I do it to the best of my abilities? Um, and, and what am I gonna learn from this? And, and look at the positive side rather than you know, trying to, to, to look at the negative side that, that begins to bring in all these other stressful emotions and then the next thing you know you can feel overwhelmed. So as students, and, and, and I try and help this with my team members um, that I work with who, who are going through difficult times or, or having um, trouble accomplishing part of their responsibility for whatever our team project is, is if I can help you, I will help you. Um, and, and I think that's the most crucial aspect to this online environment in working with these teams is how do we accomplish these goals as a team? How do we support one another? Not looking at us as individuals within the whole, looking at, looking at us as a whole unit trying to accomplish the same goal. I'm going, to, I'm going to stop right there for a second because I know we have some faculty who are probably chomping at the bit to ask a few questions. So I want to turn it over to you guys and raise your hand and I'll get over here and, and get a microphone to you. It looks like it's on this side of the room. Hi. Uh, I'm glad you're all here together uh, and it's nice to see you guys in face-to-face, -face, I'm, I'm sure it's glad to see some of us in face-to-face. -face. But, you know, you're from different majors and different things. Can Penn State World Campus do anything, regardless of your major, to make you feel more of a sense of community, uh, like you're enjoying now with one another and sharing things? You know, you don't have a pizza place or a bar to hang out with. <laughs> is, there, is there some sort of online situation we can get where what you're sharing with us, you can begin to share with other people. Any suggestions on that? Well, I think personally, I'm the president of Blue and White Society, and I think, you know, one of our biggest challenges is getting students to be involved and, you know, kind of voice their concerns um, so that we can then relay that to, you know, the proper people. I, I think it's, I think it'll be hard um, really to kind of get us together like this in a virtual sense. I think it's better when we kind of get together. I think one of the strengths too is at least giving us some of the uh, same opportunities that in-person students may have. I know when originally looking, there were a couple of schools, but Penn State kind of stood out because there are a couple other Blue and White Society members here as well, uh, sort of ancillary or related to that kind of, but also giving the opportunity for other organizations or student clubs that actually have the support of the school where other ones may not be somewhat, well, you can go do it on your own and do your own thing, and that's fine, but at least in, in trying to get one now that the support of the faculty is behind it, the support of the advisors is behind it, and the support of the school is behind that as well. And trying to get into one of the things that was done recently was a virtual pep rally uh, from the Blue and White Society, which everybody who was able to participate, uh, Google does not like me very much, apparently, but everybody who was able to do that was <laughs> able to kind of, you know, root for the school as well as there are all the different chapters, the Alumni Association, that even if you're a student, the North Texas one, like, we'll, we'll send me an email, hey, we're having this get-together, this event here, you know, you can come be a part of this. And it kind of makes you feel like, you know, you're, you're part of that family. Or being an adult learner who may have had the break, that, you know, you're still getting some of the things that the brick-and-mortar students who were able to actually have that experience on campus that you may have otherwise missed out on. Well, I, I would like to add, so wh what I would love to see is... The, to have clubs, to have a, you know, if you're in business, to have a business club, if you're in IT, to have a computer club, um, you know, that, that would make me feel more connected to not only students in the virtual, and I don't know if it could be a collaboration with the existing clubs uh, at Penn State, but to be able to be involved in those clubs would definitely make me feel more connected to the university. I, I have three things 
that I think would work. Um, one, as far as the, the clubs, ACM and IEEE are organizations that are related to um, IT and computers and engineering in general. And I don't see that much um, presence uh, um, from the world campus side. I see emails coming from the School of Engineering where they're having pizza parties and so on, which kind of brings me into the second thing. When the, um, the um, university's uh, placement, when they're having employers come in, and we have, just like they, they can live stream this, why can't they live stream when the employers come in? And we can do these meet and greets or virtual meetups, whatever, and connect with these employers as well. They're, they're working on that, actually. They needed to work on that last year. Yeah. Okay, the third thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. And the third thing is, as far as arts and culture is, the arts and culture, that's how a lot of people bond and connect. I was so excited last year to participate in some webcast of John Legend that they had. I thought that was all the way live. I didn't want to hear anyone talking to me. I was just typing my little heart out listening and he spoke afterwards. There was a woman who was the president of um, Ireland or, or somewhere over in the UK and she spoke and she was, oh, awesome dynamic presentation. Those types of situations, I don't think they get advertised enough. They need to bubble up so that the students can participate in them and increase the bandwidth so that everyone can have an optimal viewing exchange experience. If, if any of you would have an opportunity to do a short-term study abroad as an embedded part of one of your courses. <laughs> oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, was I too? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Me, me, me. Me, pick me. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Ronnie Godshock. I am the uh, BSB program coordinator just as of this July, so I want to say hello to all students, but particularly the BSB students. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your time and your talent and your comments with us. We've got a bunch of BSB faculty right here. Everybody wave. Welcome. <laughs> so they're happy to see you, and I'm happy to forward the very nice comments uh, uh, on to uh, Professor Klein and Lennon, who um, uh, Dr. Lennon was here earlier uh, yesterday, but is not here right now, so I will forward to him your Please kind do. comments. Um, I will also offer you a commercial. I am running Management 445 in Rome in Florence in spring break, which is March 7th. So you can go to Penn State Brandywine's campus website and sign up. All the information is there. Oh, Excellent. Thank you. I did see that. And, and I had been wanting to talk to you about that. <laughs> thank you. So you feel free to uh, forward me in my, my emails on the website. You're welcome to join us. It is a study abroad through our global programs, but it's open to all students. And um, finally, I would just ask, um, we are talking about, I'm working on currently um, a Yammer site for faculty, for our faculty to communicate and to build community amongst our BSB faculty. And I'm just curious if, you know, Yammers, much like Facebook, mm -hmm. if that would be something that at least the BSB students would be interested in being a part of to build online community. That's my question. What, the talker's not going to say anything? Uh, I'm not a BSB student, I, but I love Yammer. I thought Yammer was the best. It was a great tool. <laughs> Yammer is kind of wordy, I think, because if you're getting notifications about every single person's response, you know, and you don't know, you don't want to miss out on something that could be valuable to you. And, and so, um, and I'm not in BSB. I don't think I even know what that is, but, okay. <laughs> but um, the Yammer thing, it's like another social media platform that we have to keep up with. I remember before there was the, um, is it Second Life or whatever the name of? Yeah, Second Life was it. Yeah, and then it's, it's like it's too much to keep up with. Can we kind of stick to what we know, what we have, and just amp up there, you know, and I'll, use the existing? I'll say that I think that I've never used it personally, um, but I think that if you could find a way to um, embedded into Angel, so that mm -hmm. way we're not logging right. into different yeah. places. Yeah. Um, I think that that would be pretty cool. Blackboard is not, we use it for um, our BWS meetings and it's not, act, it's not very friendly. So I, I mean, if it's a great platform, I would use it. 
I think the more integration with Angel, the better. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Definitely. Is Angel up 24 7 now? Because when I went, there were there was always an outage at night, or certain days there's an uh, outage. Maintenance, maintenance, maintenance window. Maintenance. Yeah, it still goes down for routine maintenance. They have to maintain it. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. I just, just a little side point on that. It just reminded me. Um, um, if if prof it makes it a lot easier if um, you choose one way to communicate with us during the course, and not post in multiple places. Um, when you need to tell us something, <laughs> because it makes it a lot harder. So if you could just stick to email, then do that, but not post somewhere on on Angel and then on Yammer and then on you know multiple places. It becomes difficult to find information. I'm going to move on to the next question. Just so you know, we got permission to go spill over a little into lunch. Of course, you have plenty of time for lunch because we started a little late. So we've got a few more minutes, and I have a few more questions here from people. So. Uh, hi, my name is Amanda Malfinger. I'm one of the program managers at World Campus. Um, and I wanted to ask a more general question, um, why you selected World Campus to come here to school? I think we all pretty much have the same. The convenience and the flexibility that World Campus offers is the main reason why I chose it. I work full time, like I said before, and I have a child. So the flexibility that it offers is amazing, and that's the main reason why I chose it. Um, I mean, I think I'm that, like, Oh, I'm sorry. I, I think for most, well, I shouldn't say for most, but for me personally, um, I wanted to go to a Division One school. Um, you want to mm -hmm. watch football games. You want to feel like you're a part of something bigger than you. Um, there are tons of online schools now. Um, so I think it really comes down to what school speaks out to you, which one you know has uh, uh, the most involvement and things of that nature. And I think Penn State and the alumni community is just huge. and. That, that mattered to me in my decision. University ranking is, is one, and yeah, the Penn State brand, definitely. Those were the, the show stoppers. I gotta say, I may have a unique experience. I uh, went to Florida for a little bit, and I did their online uh, program for a couple years, and then I decided to switch over. And when I wa was looking for another program to go into, one of the things that I was looking for was a top-rated school, which definitely Penn State is a world-class education, still top-rated, and um, that's one of the things that drew me in. And the other thing is, it's really, really particular to Penn State. World Campus is the blue and white society and everything that, um, I, I mean, I'm the secretary, not for saying anything, but um, <laughs> everybody here better join. Um, <laughs> but um, I think that sense of community is definitely unique because Florida didn't have it. Um, University of Florida did not have anything like that. It did not feel like you were part of the program. In fact, there were students that would say things like, well, is my degree going to say University of Florida on it, or is it going to say distance education? But here at Penn State, like, you feel like you're part of something, and I think that really speaks volumes for the whole university. I looked at faculty. I mean, I looked at the faculty. I looked at their, their specializations, their interests, and I said, if I want to go to school after this and do more, who can yeah. help me get there? Yeah. Yeah. Who, what resource? I mean, Penn State is a massive resource. How can I work the network? Okay. And, I, and faculty was more important to me than where it was. Or I mean, yeah, and that, that's what I looked at. What, one, one thing I love, and, and not all my professors have done it, um, but I love my professors that have put up uh, a bio with a little bit of a resume about their background. So when I'm investigating classes, that's one of the first things I look at because um, I want to know what it'll get, it helps gauge and give me an idea of what type of uh, teaching techniques or, or information that, that I'm going to learn from this professor and, and where their mind is at and what perspective they're teaching from. Um, so just like um, some of the other panelists have said, you know, I definitely looked at, at the faculty um, and, and the brand of Penn State. And, and just the fact that we're sitting here today in this environment confirms even more that my decision to, to join Penn State was the right one because we're showing an initiative that we're, we want to continue to grow. We're not just okay with where we're at now. We, we want to continue to innovate and move towards the future and help as many people and inspire as many individuals as we can. 
I think one of the things too, um, going into, part of it was the big sense of community and the opportunities that we do have, which the others in, in looking at their programs didn't, the, the student organizations, you know, some established, some kind of upcoming or on the way. Um, and I feel like I harass my advisor about just different things to do, like, well, because I work in, in IST and there, there's, you know, we remote into certain things, like are there research opportunities that are here and reach out and bug, so I apologize if anybody, anybody sent an email from me just asking, oh, is there an opportunity here, can we do this? And generally the answer if it's not, yeah, we have that absolutely, is well, that's something we can definitely look into and try to bring into that, uh, like the, the, the Brandywine opportunity to kind of go and study abroad, even though it may not necessarily be the full semester, to at least kind of see the other cultures there and travel. Um, but one of the big things, too, was a lot of the pride that goes along with the school. There are some other programs that they may not, you know, be flaunting the sweatshirts and, and everything, but there is definitely a big sense of, you know, you're part of this. And even if you're something that you may not be actually part of the campus, where others may look at it as, oh, it's just this other little side project that we're kind of brought to the family in the fold as well. I so want to get I, one I, more question in, a, if I could. Um, to, let me, Michelle's a question quick, so let's do two more and then we'll head out. <laughs> We're available for questions after, too. Just so you know. <laughs> Come find We're us. <laughs> I fly at 3 o'clock, so no. <laughs> Send an email. Hi, I'm Michelle Wiley, and I'm the manager for academic support for World Campus. As we continue to build our academic support resources, I'm wondering if you used any of our support resources, such as tutoring or study skills, and, um, or what would you like to see, or what do you wish you would have had? Um, in terms of academic support as you've gone through your studies? I use the tutoring service for stats because um, that, that's a very hard class. <coughs> um, I didn't really get a lot from it because I'm one of those people like I need to see you do something and then I can get it. Um, reading something just doesn't work for me. Um, so I think like videos, like um, sitting in on a particular class like stats for instance and recording a professor that lesson, you know, lessons for the for the semester, I, and then having that archived, I think that would be ideal because I ended up having to actually Google a different school who archived those particular lessons and um, looked at those on YouTube. I had a difficult what time with stats as well, as the tutoring as well. well. That was kind of limited <clears throat> for me, so that would be, it'd be great if we could somehow extend that. What would be really great as well is um, I've been taking classes with uh, World Campus for about 10 years now, a little bit at a time, two classes, one class, um, depending on my schedule, that's my life. Um, but what happens is when I have to take a break for a semester, my whole email gets pre erased and my folders <coughs> on Angel are all erased and I have to start anew again the following semester. What would be nice if it, if it could be archived and if I took off a semester, and the following semester, I would just have all my folders back again. And I noticed that um, classes that I took several years ago, my folders are, are not available to me. And I would like to see the folders available. Because um, sometimes I want to reflect on a class that I took um, and as a resource. I so do that too. email, uh, having the email long term and having the folders available on a long term basis would be great. I think your financial aid group is very strong. Um, they tipped me off on how to handle my student loans better um, and, and how to finance my summer classes because student loans uh, typically don't cover summer school, but if you get paid your loan amount in the fall and the spring, you can use it to cover your summer classes. And they were able to let me know that. I, so I can, I'll be able to complete my degree much sooner as a result. Um, and that, that, that's very appealing to me. Obviously, you know, I, I, I'd like to do this before I'm 80, so I'm, I'm really trying to get this done. You know, when I'm nickel and diming it, it, it's a challenge, and I really appreciate the fact that they took the time. They didn't have to, you know, I, I didn't know, and they, they, you know, went out of their way to do that. I think that's a strong support that I don't know if a lot of people are aware of, uh, but they're a really good resource. Postgraduate support, I think that that's an area that needs improvement. Um, I applied for positions as I was about to graduate. And after a few months, I was getting emails, you know, still in my um, webmail account 
and account services said, well, you're not currently registered, um, so you can no longer have access to those, email, to those emails. All the attachments are well too bad. You can't have it anymore. It's gone. And I think that's ridiculous. There are schools that I went to 10 years ago. I still have an email account on there. I'm not trying to connect with Al-Qaeda. I'm trying to connect with an employer. And so they should allow oh people to get access to their emails and, and other support type um, activities, we should still be a part of it. So my name, is, uh, uh, my name is Larry Reagan, and I'm involved in a center at Penn State looking at innovations that can help us in learning. So um, I, you might not be able to give me a response to this, but I'd like you to think about it, and maybe I could follow up with Richard and get an email out to you. So two things I want to plant a seed. One is, if there was a, a technological or a pedagogical that is a teaching innovation that would make your learning better, could you think of that and describe it? That's one thing. And I'll send that question out to you because I'd love to get some feedback on that. But that's one that sort of has to incubate a little bit, I think. <laughs> the second point I wanted to make, so I appreciated the gentleman uh, making the comment about the research opportunities. The center I'm involved in is looking for student input on research projects. That is involvement in research projects. And we have a small amount of funding that we can actually make available for proposals, for projects that, that can potentially impact the learning. And, and we're trying to really reach out to the student community, probably not doing as good of a job as we need to to say, you know, would you like to be involved in, in any of these research projects, or do you have an idea that, that you could use a little bit of funding to, to try something new? It's got to be innovative. Uh, it's obviously in a technological environment, so it's got to be online. And, and the important, and I think the critical aspect is it has to affect learning. So, for example, the idea about the access to the emails, we're not going to be able to help you too much on that. But if there's some technique or a method or a silver bullet thing, man, if I had this, it would have really aided me. It would have really helped me get my content. I'd really like you to think about that. And if you're interested in the research dimension, I'll be around. Please let me know. I'll give you my card. I'd love to have you sign up so we can put you on our list. But also, thank you for being here today. This has been wonderful. Boy, do I have ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure he'll take them. Uh, Can you say one thing? Yes. One thing. As a master's level student, I am, you know, awakened to the world of research. And I don't know if the brick and mortar students who are in master's degree program get first dibs on their professors, you know, for writing projects or doing research or helping them out on an article and do stuff like that. But I really do believe that that's something that would have helped me um, be more directed in being able to produce my writing. So, I mean, I, I mean, I got an opportunity, a professor asked me, you know, could you help me teach this class next semester? And that was the one class that I actually took in the building. Um, but, I mean, the idea of, you know, recognizing students, saying this is your interest, you know, is, would you mind helping me on this article, learning how to do that research? Um, I mean, thankfully, my husband's a PhD, so I tagged along his just watching him learning how to do it. But that is something as a master's degree student that I would have appreciated. I agree. I think that's a really great point. I know, I realize I'm uh, the only thing standing between uh, you and lunch right now. <laughs> so um, I, I'm, I'm going to end it here. But I really want to thank all of you, all of these great students, for taking the time out of your lives uh, to come to State College Pennsylvania and spend some time with us and spend some time with the faculty and sit through this panel and answer our questions and, and really help us become better educators. So thank you very much. If we could give them a big round of applause. I'm going to turn it over to Drew. Thanks for hanging out. Um, good stuff, y'all. Um, and yes, you can come to lunch, too. So. <laughs> uh, let's eat. <laughs>